Okay, well, we'll get started and uh, we hope the best. Uh, I've received a lot of slides in the very last minute, so I hope that I can manage the technical, uh, technical part smoothly. So with, uh, with that good wish, this is our final, uh, final session and uh, we are very, very pleased. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for joining and for staying with us through this entire time and for, for your very uh, warm engagement. We've received lots of very, very positive messages from many of you and I really uh, thank you for this. Uh, this is really important because we're not we are deprived of an opportunity to actually sit with you, have a meal, and, and engage in a personal way. And this is uh, ensemble, physically, dans la même. So for our, for today, what we thought was we've had three sessions with different uh, specific topics. We also had the first session with the webinar with the mayors and and the experts. So we've had a lot of different feedback, and you've been working on on the different assignments, uh, sort of in smaller groups, thinking through. So the idea today is to really um, brainstorm a bit more and try to come up with um, sort of a, a, a solutions, you might say. Not necessarily final solutions, or it's really brainstorming solutions, because there's a lot that gets said at the sort of conceptual level, and then there's all the site managers, as we've seen, working at the ground level, trying to deal with solutions every day. We need to be able to find a way to bridge these different levels and really brainstorm practical solutions, especially now, because we're in a moment where we can't just be talking. We have to, what is it that we have to do? So it's this idea of what is it véritablement passer la réflexion à l'action. next. And who are the different people who can do this and how can we do this is what we want to really brainstorm a bit out together. And that's why it's a lab because it's not, you know, two people who have the solution. It's we are all of us working together. We're very excited to have today um, a group of very innovative thinkers, aside from their expertise, whom we call provocateurs. Who were, who, were, who were invited here primarily to, to say things that will help us think in a different direction or, or somehow uh, give us their insight, which we very greatly value. So, we're, and they each have only three minutes to do this enormous task. And they have uh, the grand uh, possibility of showing one slide which I hope that I can technically manage. <laughs> so with all those caveats, uh, we begin. First of all, we have Carola Hein, who teaches at the Technical University of Delft and is the chairperson there of the Architecture and Theory program. Carola, please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for this great session so far. Uh, it's been a pleasure to see all those different interventions and hear all these high-level conceptualizations and ideas. Um, and I have greatly appreciated also the insights from all the different corners of the world, from uh, Iran, from Kenya, and uh, all the other parts. There are a few things that have struck me and that I would like to discuss with you briefly. The first one is the question, well, actually, who is the community that we are talking about? Um, and what, in what time does this community exist? Does the, if we all appreciate these historical sites, does the son of the baker really want to become the next baker? How do we deal with people who move into the community and who may actually want to pick up uh, the kind of lifestyle that we appreciate. So whose resilience are we actually appreciating? And to discuss that a little bit further and maybe give you some ideas how this plays out on a, on a larger scale, I would argue that we have to think about a heritage ecosystem. And for me, this is very much in line with also the ideas of the historic urban landscape approach. So let's think about tatamis. This is one of my favorite buildings ever, the Ryuanji Temple in Kyoto. And you see the floors with the historic tatamis on them. 
But these tatamis are not just a thing that is lying there. They're actually part of a lifestyle. You sleep on them, you eat on them, you have to put your uh, foot your, tata, your futons away uh, every day. They depend on a, he, on a complete livelihood, on a system of tatami makers, on knowledge, on little shops that exist until today and that shape your local main street. Uh, and these tatami shops have been diminishing. There's only 10% left of what was there a couple of decades ago. I, in, I, I interviewed the guy in the shop in Kyoto. So how can we make sure that these cultures continue to exist because they're part of everyday practices. Look at an Aikido dojo on the top left, but also look at a big temple. And they are part of the everyday where you sleep, where you live, even in contemporary Japan. So what are the creative solutions? So like this guy who was recently featured, who has come up with making differently shaped tatamis, he have put together in the pattern of a dragon, so that we can actually have a kind of heritage ecosystem where all the elements, the objects we want to preserve, the practices, the lifestyles come together in one. And to conclude this, my question would be, are we talking to the right people? I looked briefly at all our, sum or our summaries and we have a lot of architects and planners and heritage and management, but we have little in terms of uh, economics or business, for example. That also means, do we use the right words? Because this event was also so fascinating because it brought together people from different parts of the world. So I'm inviting us to think about the heritage we all treasure and want to preserve in the sense of a heritage ecosystem, in the sense of a long-standing community over time and who this community actually includes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I believe my voice is not coming clearly, so I was trying to see if I could use my um, headphones, but it's not working either, so we try to do our best. Um, we have now um, Katie Ravindran, who is joining us from India, uh, and who has been uh, before the, uh, the, the dean uh, of the, uh, the School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi. Um, and uh, has been uh, has has been teaching and practicing uh, on conservation issues for a very very large number of years. Katie, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, could I have my slides on? There were three slides, the ones which you just showed as samples, they were my slides. Yes. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Uh, basically, uh, the three minutes that I have, I have devoted to picking up three separate issues pertaining to the three different sessions. So the first session being on communities, which of course right now also Ms. Hines have talked about uh, a heritage ecosystem. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm finding that there is a gap, major gap in that ecosystem. So normally uh, when the world heritage sites are running the risk of isolation from the, what you can conceptually call the locality, it's not just the physical locale, but also the concept of the locality as a, as a community connect. Then what methods can we be used to develop community ownership of the site? Who will monitor and regulate this relationship? This is a very important question. The second question of monitoring uh, and regulating the relationship because it can't be a free for all because then the community will just take over the site because it will be free for all. So there has to be a regulated relationship and there is no agency who is in fact at present fit or capable of filling that gap 
of monitoring and regulating this relationship. That's the first issue. May I have the second slide, please? The second slide uh, pertains to the uh, economic development strategy in which uh, particularly we are now in a condition where COVID-19 and the lockout has destroyed the supply chains of artisans, both in sourcing raw materials as well as the existing markets which have become dysfunctional. Their livelihood is at stake. In fact, many of them are in very desperate condition even now. A lot of us are sending money to you know, uh, NGOs who are helping them to recover and so on. There are innovative methods being sponsored by some companies like you pay for their product now and once uh, they are able to produce it with the finance that they receive, they will be able to supply you at a later stage. And there are companies appealing for that kind of help. <clears throat> but besides this, uh, one thing that we need to remember is that the COVID-19 is not something that is just going to go away. We are being told by doctors after doctors that this is a condition which is the attracted condition. And this time gap that we'll have is sufficient to destroy the entire artisanal base. So uh, one of the sources that we can rely on is the application of new technology. So what kind of new technologies can be, be, can be deployed to salvage them from penury as well as to retain the traditional skills? That is to ensure that they don't leave their current skilled trade and move on to say some kind of a manual labor or you know, kind of building labor or some such thing or become a factory worker so that to so as to earn a living so how what methods what technology can be, be uh, deployed for to salvage them from this condition this is the second question i think this is a major area of gap there's not been sufficient discussions on this how can technology be deployed to ensure uh, if not an incessant flow but at least an intermittent flow of resources both in terms of financial as well as material resources for artisanal production, as well as to uh, help restructure a market which has already collapsed. May I have the third slide, please? Now, third and the last slide is, uh, is on the urban infrastructure idea. <clears throat> we had a whole session, very interesting session on urban infrastructure. But one, one thing that I'd like to point out to you is that the infrastructure heritage in heritage areas are largely seen as hard infrastructure like roads, electricity, water, firefighting, etc. Most of our discussions on infrastructure have been centered around this hard introduction of hard infrastructure into heritage areas. Yet, if you look at public spaces as in heritage areas as cultural products and not just physical products, where space itself is a primary soft infrastructure for ensuring cultural continuity. That is, the manner in which this space is disposed, the manner in which space is culturally constructed, and the manner in which it is used by different communities at different times actually value adds that space. And space itself then becomes an infrastructure for the community's continuity of their traditions. So this is what I'm calling soft infrastructure. It's not only space, there are also way, many other layers of soft infrastructure that we need to be built up. And how does one map this, this uh, soft infrastructure and how does one manage it? That is the next question. So these are the three questions I wanted to raise. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So now we move uh, to, uh, to Marie Noel Turno, uh, who is an associate uh, specialist at the uh, WITRAP, the World Heritage Training in the Asia Pacific. It's a category two center of UNESCO. Um, Marie Noel? Marie Noel, I just saw you. Did we lose Marie Noel? Marie Noel? 
Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Please go ahead. Um, so I I prepared a, a PowerPoint which is much too long. I don't know if you you received it. I just sent it last minute. But if you haven't, I didn't never mind. Uh, receive it. Uh, but uh, if you have, you have only one slide or no slides, so it's up to I, you. I have several slides, but I'll. I'll um, Can you pick one? So I I will select one. Thank I've you. got two. I've got two. I am on it. So should I try and do the share screen? Yes, please. Thing. I feel like a dinosaur. Not really. Maybe we could just make your point, and then we can put it up. Okay. So the the point is actually I'm going back to 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 hard planning. Um, and and the point is, if we look at um, references to historic urban landscape, but the discussion there's been in the in the, the past day, I would really like to stress going out of the world heritage boundaries when we refer to world heritage or historic areas, and further look at this challenge of the dual integration of urban heritage conservation in urban development and planning practices. So how can we go beyond the versus looking at development at large uh, being having negative impact, but looking how you can build on heritage values and, and attributes and, and qualities. And again, there's been several questions posed on this focusing on, on communities, for what? And there I think it's it's the improvement of quality of life. This is also promoted in the SDGs, if we, depending on which jargon or references, institutional references. So within our, let's say, well, heritage references, this is would be rethinking the role and function of, ref, of heritage. Want to be specific? This is Article Five One of of the Convention. Can you, can yes? you see now what I'm showing on the screen? Is um, this what you want to show? Yeah, but this is to. So I'm moving down. You you can move down, move down. Yes, this is this slide. You just okay. up, maybe go back up a bit. Again, move up. Okay, never mind then. We won't. Okay, just just to get. Yeah, don't need to. So it's this idea of uh, learning from from a heritage. So this this means is regarding the approach. This is flipping the coin. It's heritage for development, cultural and natural values as assets. So how can we achieve better building and development design looking at heritage values, form, space that can be used in contemporary and modern design, be it for large scale or small scale. <coughs> Same thing for transportation. Are there traditional know-hows or historic ways of transport that can be improved or used as a reference for new, new design? For mitigating pollution, we've been talking about resilience. Okay, what are the forms? What are the practices? What are the spaces uh, that traditional um, spaces or, or historic areas, cities, uh, have put forward and that we need to learn again from? Something very basic is the localization, the situation of a city within a ge geographic area. Um, so there are a number of elements where we could be looking at main threats and, and looking at the, the assets. How can you alleviate depressed economies, poverty? Uh, again, looking at uh, heritage values, the previous examples were, were about that. So it's really stressing heritage is not a commodity, but a public good. That means uh, for tourism, again, we're looking at things differently. So one element, if we start looking at the solutions or, or, or approaches is how can actually heritage be saved by planning. 
So we always kind of oppose modern development, modern planning as, as a threat. But again, can urban planning save heritage? Can heritage improve urban and territorial planning? So again, we come to the very classic, uh, looking at mapping values, looking at significance. But if we go more into the details, again, how can land use and functional mixed use look at heritage values? Uh, how can we keep commerce and retail? How can we look at density, uh, building envelopes, height control, which are very much hard planning tools, looking at mobility, infrastructure, and, and funding tools. But again, each time approach them through a lens of heritage values. So that is what I call um, flipping the coin. Water, for example, there are lots of traditional water management systems. Can they be preserved? Can they be also adapted of scale? Well, that's, that's the general idea. Let's flip the coin. Development based on heritage, not as a threat. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marinael. Um, I think you brought up a lot of points and you have a lot of points uh, also on your slides, which we will certainly put up and include uh, and will be very helpful for, for our reflection and thinking. We now move to uh, Suibu Varisu. We are very delighted to have you join us. Suibu is the director of the World Heritage, uh, the African World Heritage Fund, a Category 2 center and, our, and, and a very close partner. Suibu, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Jyoti. I would like to, once again to thank uh, all colleagues. Uh, I can see here uh, 63 colleagues that are connected. And I used to speak French, but for the purpose of this meeting, I will try and speak English, hoping that you can understand. And uh, maybe to also stay in the five minutes that are given for provocative uh, a talk, uh, I would like to say that first, I'm not an architect, I'm not an urbanist. So my perspective would be a little bit uh, different. And I would maybe take it from the various intervention uh, angle that uh, looked uh, uh, anonymous, but it's, uh, it was extremely big in uh, some of the presentations. It's about uh, the fact that uh, uh, you have some abundance niches and uh, settlement and uh, in your urban environment and uh, you also have a lot of unused places and uh, at the world hated site or anyway in urban environment and uh, most of the site managers were actually uh, raising issues around that how to deal with it and uh, just to further elaborate a little bit on that i would like to say that uh, the protective approach or rational that we have with heritage is one of the, the challenge taken from the African environment where you have a number of competition of priorities, including from an economic perspective. The previous speaker just touched on that, for instance. If you take a site like Robben Island, which is based here in South Africa, is one of those world hated sites, a former a prison for political prisoners. And if you check the occupational rate now, it's around 15%. If you take the physical uh, place, which is extremely low when you compare to, but it's not only at Robben Island, you take another world hated site in West Africa, for instance, Abumi. Royal Palaces of Abumi in Benin is also the occupational play rate is extremely low. And uh, at the same time, those places, those uh, two places that I just talked of, are facing massive, uh, let's say, cost of maintenance. And that's the, the heart of the, the matter. Well, for instance, for Robben Island, for instance, the cost of maintenance is... Uh, more than 20% of operational budget. That money has to come from somewhere. For Abome, it also has to come from somewhere. So when buildings are locked with a very low rate of occupation, how 
what sustainability mechanisms are then in place when at the same time around those places you have that pressure from communities. Where right? for Agume, for instance, they want to uh, the the negotiation to set up business, for instance. And I know that the government is trying to see how the a kind of school for royal, because it's a formal, it's it's, it's palaces, uh, how a center for royal dances can, for instance, been put in place so that uh, it doesn't deviate too much from the spirit, what we call esprit de lieu, from the, the, the spirit of the, the place, you see, which is about uh, heritage. And uh, I'm one of those persons who, let's say, strongly, would strongly like to advocate for a kind of uh, how do we enhance what we can say the adaptive reuse. It's not new, but how are we implementing it? And the concept of adaptive reuse of heritage place or urban, uh, urban, urban places, adaptive not only in terms of uh, the occupation rate, physical occupation rate, but also in terms of function so that it has a meaning in the livelihood of communities for which that places or th those places have been uh, uh, put uh, as, a, as heritage. For me, adaptive reuse is definitely a way forward to see, to build resilience and uh, that uh, uh, system that we are talking of. So heritage, we, as an asset, is true. It has to be saved, but it also has to be used. And uh, this is maybe one challenge that we as heritage, but looking at it from also a strategic document from African Union that we have to be dealing with on a daily basis, being site manager of uh, being in an organization like African World Heritage Fund. So that's what I would like to say. I'm quite available to take up the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we now move uh, to Minja Yan. Minja is uh, very well known. Uh, she was uh, the director of the New Delhi office of UNESCO for a number of years uh, and has been working on, on many of these issues uh, for a very long time. And she was fiercely the deputy director of the World Heritage Center also. Minja, over to you. I have to bring your slides up and I'm not finding them at this second. So you have to give me a minute. Can you hear me? Meanwhile, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can hear very you. Good. Well, thank you very much for uh, uh, involving me in this uh, very interesting uh, lab. And uh, although I haven't been able to listen to all the presentations and the debates, uh, I have um, looked at it and I found all the subjects starting from the well-being of the community, local economic development strategies, urban infrastructure structure and historic contents. All of this has been very, very, everything is necessary in all of it to promote uh, heritage-based sustainable development recovery resilience. All of these are really needed, but, um, after the discussions of all these so, all sorts of problems that have arised, uh, uh, different people have given different case studies, and, um, but obviously there are contradictions. Uh, and a lot of it is, to, is because there is not really an acceptance of the, necessi of the acceptance of the, of the reality of the evolutions of cities, along with lifestyles. People are not going to uh, refrain from changing their lifestyles. So all of this uh, needs a sort of a major change in the World Heritage inscription and the monitoring process. And in order to foresee all sorts of changes in the management plan. And although it's now been uh, many years that the management plan is necessary, many, many, many sites especially those sites that have been inscribed earlier, still don't have the management plan. And although the new sites do have management plan, there's absolutely no form of a monitoring process. And, and increasingly, UNESCO in our advisory bodies are sort of not aware of what's going on. So I have one message uh, to present to this uh, concluding session. And in my provocation, if you like, 
is that World Heritage Sites should be inscribed only for six years or a determined period, then reviewed for the authenticity and in integrity according to the OUV and in according to the management plan to see if that requires updating or not. And, and, and the management plan must be foreseen to permit evolution towards modern lifestyles while maintaining the core attributes of the site and its integrity. So I have here uh, an, an, a slide, it's a bit cramped, and I draw your attention to the bottom part, this declaration of the NARA, NARA expert meeting on integrity of historic sites, which took place in 1999, you know, 1999, it's a long time ago. <laughs> and, and this was a, an attempt to complement the NARA Declaration on Authenticity, which had become a very, very important uh, uh, document. So the conclusion of this expert meeting was that we cannot talk about integrity uh, as applied to historic uh, cities unless we have an understanding of the value of the historic analysis of the elements making up the integrity of a city. Sustainability, that's important, economic, social, environmental, and cultural, the viable cities. And importantly, the question of equity and access, accessibility. So this, the, the debate that followed, which finally led to the 2011, uh, the whole um, uh, recommendation is very good. But unfortunately, even among experts, the notion of HAL is still tied mainly to visual integrity. And how about the functional integrity? Other speakers have mentioned about functional uh, integrity. So I think that um, we really need to uh, really devise a system in which UNESCO, the advisory bodies, can play a greater motivational role. Because once a site is inscribed, the state's parties are not prepared to make a great big huge effort anymore. So unless the, the committee decides to make it absolutely you know, a necessity to review it once every so often, then we, we're not, things are not going to improve. We can be talking about the contradictions and the problems for many years to come and things are not going to improve. So if the World Heritage Convention is to become and maintain as the main um, uh, international treaty for the protection of a natural, and, uh, a natural mixed and um, cultural heritage, we have to change the process, you know. So, so the point that I want to make is by showing this slide on Chakra Sahib, and of course, that is one example out of many, many, many examples. And although the OUV has specifically mentioned that it's a collection of exceptional monuments and ancient quarters with, which were, bear a bit a witness to the city's secular development, etc., etc. I mean, the reality is that once it's been inscribed, there was a massive demolition of all the, uh, the vernacular buildings or the uh, common people's buildings around the monumental site. So the context is totally lost. I mean, th these pictures don't show uh, well enough what's happened to this place. I mean, there's humongous uh, supermarket, uh, you know, a style uh, um, parking lots all over the monuments and even within the core area all the small buildings have been, um, the vernacular buildings have been demolished. And the photo that you see on the right-hand side of the, uh, uh, of the slide shows a kind of wonderful, wonderful courtyard houses that have been destroyed. I mean, hundreds of these have been destroyed. And the normal people, the inhabitants who live there have been pushed out. And now there's a huge wall and behind the walls, fortunately, are still some of these traditional courtyard buildings that remain. Now, this is not just in Shekhar Saeed. Samarkand is the same thing. Bukhara, a little bit better because it's been done a little bit more, you know, tastefully, if you like. But, so, but again, this is happening all over Asia and all over, uh, even in Europe, for that matter, you know. But at least we can say that in Europe, because of very strong uh, local authority intervention, I'm talking about in EU, uh, Western Europe, if you like, that governments and local authorities subsidize, uh, uh, you know, um, people in order to maintain a sort of functional um, integrity. So there are public transports that are well-designed and uh, social housings are 
exists right in the middle of the core monumental area. So everything is done in the name of, if you like, democracy and equity and accessibility in that historic areas are not just an oasis of tourists and uh, shopping, you know, open air shopping malls for, for, for tourists. But now as this COVID has shown, now that the people are not there anymore, you know, Thank it you. causes a major problem. So that's what I wanted to mention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minja. And of course, as, as, as you're all aware, Minja is also now the president of the Ramon Lemaire Center, International Center at uh, the Catholic University of Leuven. So we're very grateful for these insights, Mia. Thank you very much. Um, we are expecting Jody Pasquale, but I think he has not been able to join us. Uh, Jody, are you online? Jody Pasquale uh, from the uh, United Cities and Local Governments uh, is very engaged with culture at a number of levels. Jody, are you online? I think he's not able to join us. Uh, so uh, we are sorry to miss him, but we will then move on. So we move now to the next part of our, uh, uh, our presentation, which is the, um, uh, the, the group work, uh, which is a very exciting part, which is what everybody has been working on the last several days. We have four groups presenting. I was sent some slides and then I was told there's been changes to all the slides that have been sent and so on. So to avoid any further confusion, I'm going to let each group deal with their own slides. And so we count on you to show us the slides and somehow bring them up. Um, so please, we've been with group A. Please introduce yourself in terms of uh, what region you're representing and how you structured your work and please show us your slides. You have 10 minutes for everything. Go Hello. ahead, please. Hello, I'm Maya Shizawa. I'm from Peru, but based in Germany and I'm representing a group that was composed of members from uh, Europe and Latin America. Uh, so I'm talking on behalf of Neje from Turkey, Rosabella from Peru, Irina from Romania, Cristina from Brazil, Miliana from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Lorena from Chile, Ana Paula and Benedetta from Italy. Ana Paula, can you share your screen, please? Great, thank you. So the next slide, please. So first we wanted to start with our framework that it's actually a disclaimer because this was uh, a very ambitious uh, project of assignments and uh, therefore we could work on them and reflect on them but we don't have an answer for all the topics proposed. Uh, also not all the contributions from the members of this group have been included in this pre presentation but hopefully some additions can be done during the discussions and in the report. Another important point is that uh, the pandemic is still ongoing and therefore we still need some time from, for processing before having clear solutions of how uh, to intervene in urban areas. Another issue is that uh, the path of the pandemic is very different from region to region and from city to city. So there are cities like Bonn where I live where we are getting out already from the big crisis but there are cities like Lima uh, or, Chile, or Santiago in Chile, where they are actually now in the very high moment of the, of the crisis. So this is also something that uh, was important to share. And um, another thing that we found out is that the solutions need to be place specific, but we can share some principles. And so this is what we will comment on this presentation. Next slide. So for the first uh, innovative strategy um, that was about integrating communities in decision-making and governance, so we were reflecting about how much we have to um, think about integration versus empowerment. Uh, probably the idea of integration is just uh, too centered on the officers or heritage practitioners and so on, but not necessarily on the communities themselves, where maybe uh, we need to give them more tools to be the actors and the leading people for, for changes. 
and therefore we consider that uh, an important part of the work is to identify local actors, leaders, and existing networks that are already uh, doing things on the ground and that can be uh, connected uh, to the works of the municipalities or officers, etc. Another issue was the inclusiveness, so how to include more actors, especially the local actors. Um, so there are some examples of how to include actors and the civil society in advisory boards or coordination and supervision boards, for example, in Turkey, where uh, certain parts of the society, uh, NGOs or uh, local residents are also part of these decision-making processes. Another point is that uh, we can learn in this uh, aspect also from other World Heritage properties, not necessarily only look in World Heritage cities, but options and, and proposals that are being taken in mixed heritage sites, uh, combining nature and culture, um, and also in cultural landscapes where there are so many different uh, actors. And so there are some alternatives of how to include all these different actors in this type of boards or uh, boards of directors or organizations. Another point is that there has been a lot of failure in research and where the people, places, and considerations of the impacts to people have not been properly uh, surveyed, the desires and the needs and the ways of thinking. And therefore, we have some examples, for example, in Verona, where there is a participatory identification, documentation, and monitoring of the heritage. So this is also an alternative to a top-down approach to research or to solving the problems of people. And another point is strengthening community-based activities and community-based management. This we have seen with examples from, from uh, Visegrad exhibitions in Bosnia-Herzegovina and also the washing of the wharf that is in the picture now uh, and the community-based museum in Brazil. Next slide, please. For the second uh, questionnaire, um, integration, uh, oh, sorry, uh, developing infrastructure for community well-being. So we had an example from the Plaza de Acho in Lima, where during the pandemic, uh, the bull ring was uh, immediately converted in a place for homeless people to protect homeless people from COVID. So the idea of giving a new function that could be temporary or permanent two flexible historical buildings is one uh, idea. Then the idea of dedicating the public spaces for cultural activities and community practices, such as in Verona, or the creation of temporary infrastructure for communities' basic needs, for example, water fountains in public spaces, or as Katie mentioned, some more uh, soft infrastructure. Then, uh, creation of a tourist control system together with the residents, so uh, always considering this idea of integrating the community in the solutions. And uh, something that is very important and that we don't have a solution for is to address the problem of markets in the historic centers where the space for warehouse and overcrowding is very critical, especially in this moment. Uh, next slide, please. Then for the third question, uh, we had some examples from Safran Bolu in, um, in Turkey, where traditional crafts and artisans should be identified and documented within historic urban areas, uh, projects which will ensure the integration of traditional crafts with the currently needed products should be supported by municipalities or conservation institutions and funding partners. The training or, uh, programs, the creation of training programs should be organized to preserve and maintain traditional crafts. And also we need to establish multi-sectoral partnerships between city, culture, public, public, private, academia, and civil society. Um, there is also an example from the whole village project in Romania. There is a world heritage in Vispiri. Uh, where there is a combination of all these aspects that maybe refer to uh, the heritage ecosystem, uh, which considers the restoration, but also a local entrepreneurship, uh, considering the rural businesses and capacity building, for, uh, capacity building and uh, also developing sustainable cultural tourism, some ecotourism activities. Next. Next slide, please. Yes. So for the fourth uh, strategy on alternative financing, 
Um, we have the example of Digi Japin in China, uh, where there is a cooperative model uh, connecting local production, e-trade, festivals, permaculture cor courses, tourism that also invites urban consumers, um, which uh, would be useful for uh, supporting the use and development of new technologies. That's one strategy and engaging researchers, schools, and universities, and connecting them to the needs of local communities. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, I'm going very fast. Um, so the fifth one is rethink rethinking urban infrastructure in the histor uh, historic urban context. So these ideas come from Valparaíso, Chile. Um, so one strategy would be that the new urban infrastructure or public space projects which will be inserted to the historic urban areas should address primarily the needs of the local communities identified with a, part a participatory approach, that the new urban infrastructure or public space projects which will be inserted to the historic urban areas should be developed in a way that does not negatively affect the OUV of the area as well as the values of a wider setting, and that large infrastructure projects uh, need to be integrated into the historical cities uh, with the evaluation of the scope of the development plan, master plans, and the physical, social, and economic effects of the mentioned projects. Uh, this should be evaluated in a multidimensional way before taking action by conducting a heritage impact assessment studies. And uh, also, um, I think this is something important to mention is that soon there will be a new impact assessment uh, guidance uh, that is going, uh, that is being done by the World Heritage Leadership Program, where there is consideration uh, about the integration of the different sectors, uh, integrating impact assessment in uh, management plans of World Heritage Properties, but this should also go beyond World Heritage Properties and also include uh, the larger setting. Next slide, please. So the innovation strategy six uh, for uh, public spaces. So this comes from uh, an example in uh, Bosnia. A new urban infrastructure public space project which will be inserted to the historic urban areas should also contribute to the social and economic development of the community. And one big challenge is to think about uh, conserving the historic structures while also addressing uh, people needs. And uh, for the post-COVID scenarios, uh, we think that uh, stay at home and work at home is not the same for all and all communities or historic urban areas that uh, tend to be impoverished. This is a big issue. Uh, we have to think about a people-centered recovery because uh, the historic urban centers would not uh, be uh, valuable without the people and also consider the idea of uh, green infrastructure and through parks and urban farming. In these pictures, you can see on the left side, there is this uh, very famous uh, festival procession in, in Lima that uh, congregates thousands of people and it's done in October and it's very, very traditional. And uh, for sure, this is something that is not going to be able to maintain this year and probably in the years to come. So this is a big, big uh, issue to address as, as well. Next slide, please. Sorry. And this is also uh, an example from the Jipian, so this cooperative model, where the lockdown situation has widened the cooperative's numbers of consumers and reinforces business, and more people became confident in buying products online and in delivering them at home, and more consumers now look for organic and natural products from local farmers, so this is on the on the positive side of the uh, evolvement of the pandemic. So this would be an idea for the future. Um, this is all. Thank you very much. Um, I think there um, my other colleagues will like to um, share later in the discussion some of more position on their ideas. Thank you very much. This was excellent. Very. You managed to do a lot in a very short time uh, and you managed to share it very well in a short time as well. So a big thank you for that. Um, uh, I just want to add before we move on that we did agree uh, with, with all the participants who've been working in the groups uh, so assiduously that we would uh, provide the opportunity to continue working in groups on teams 
for another two weeks. So we won't dismantle. You'd have your logins and you'd be able to continue working, organize each of the groups as you have been. So that at the end of two weeks, we could have uh, more of a substantial report that could be useful for everybody. Because I think the kind of solutions you're all coming up with is amazing. And it's really useful to have this compendium for everybody. Um, so I thought that that could be a more useful outcome to this meeting if we just allowed that opportunity. So please take it that you could uh, continue. And I also want to thank uh, Lorena Perez today for uh, very kindly agreeing to be our rapporteur today. Today is the hardest day to be a rapporteur, so thank you very much, Lorena. <laughs> because we're jumping around so many people and so many ideas, you have to be on your toes grasping everything. All right, now we move to group B. Group B over two. Yeah, hi. My name is Buni. So I'm representing group B and my team member to present our works today. So let me share the slide to you now. Could you tell us a little bit where you're all from? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm from Malaysia. Uh, Penang, Georgetown. So my team members are Shika Jain from India, then Gurmit Rai from India, Afsane Sultani from Iran, and Imei Chang from China. So can you guys see my shared screen or I haven't shared it now? Not yet, not yet. Okay. Yes, so, we can see it now. So as I mentioned just now, uh, these are my team members. So let's get straight started to the innovative strategy that proposed from our group. So the first one under the topic of well-being and local communities is engaged in the wider community through education and equitable benefit sharing. So based on the education and capacity building programs, it is actually very crucial to make sure the local communities are aware of the values and the importance of the site, which is the location that are staying at and act according to the regulations. And then another thing is, it is also equitable benefit sharing mechanism to the tangible incentive for the local communities. So as you can see from the photos shared here, it's actually one of the example of the tangible heritage workshop um, from Penang, Georgetown, provided to the local communities and also the contractors to understand what are the regulation and what are the proper steps they should do during the construction works. Then the next one is the recognition of community practice by the local, co by local authorities and also governors. So the authorities should actually participate in the identification wider introduction and formal recognition of traditional local community practices and try to safeguard the places where these practices take place in regard in, uh, to these activities. So one of the example we take is the Shiraz Historic City, the Ashura Annual Morning. So each year on the occasion of Ashura, pilgrims and mourners that have been mourning for 10 days in other districts of the city. So everyone have to walk from the Shachara on Ashura as their common destination. And then this uh, community practice have been authorized by the local authority to carry out every year. Next is the community consultation in development projects. So the communities may be involved in the government system as part of communities that review the proposal of for upgrading or maintaining the city space. So by doing the or conducting the individual house survey, social mapping and public consultation for all these proposed plan, it is important to gather or collect the committee's inputs, uh, opinion and also suggestion because they are the one who stay inside the city. That's why we need to collect their opinions to do better improvement to them. And then besides, communities should be also made aware of their role in maintaining the proposed projects during the post-implementation stage. 
So one of the examples here is the participatory work design from DRONA. So the work proposals is being exhibited to the committee and the young architects are being trained by the master craftsmen to explain the detail of the proposal to the local community. Next is about the technical and financial support for minor repair works. Residents in heritage area always facing the biggest challenge, which is facing uh, to repair their heritage building where repairation work always require high costing. So by providing the technical and financial support to the local residents will actually ease their burden and ensure the conservation works properly. So one of the example we take here is the neighborhood neighborhood planner program from China. So in China, civil infrastructure like electricity, water and internet are usually taken care of by the muni municipality. For the residents in the heritage areas, the biggest challenge is for them is actually modernize their interior spaces to a better quality of life. So not only this require design skill and full knowledge of conservation regulation, but it's actually also cost a lot. So from China there, um, the technical team and the local government actually provide design to support for the local residents to renovate their heritage buildings or residential area. Next is the alternative ways of community practice. Um, this is actually to encourage entrepreneurship in the history, historic city center. So during building, by building restoration in large degraded historic areas provides a wide range of job opportunities for the residents and locals. So uh, through these programs trains the youth and and also can reduce the social harm such as addiction and prostitution in the and child labor. So one example is from the Shiraz historic city. So as you can see from the photos, these are the renovation or upgradation work done within the Shiraz historic city. This also give a revived image to the Shiraz historic city. Next is the community-based inventory for documentation purpose and as the main source of database. So due to crisis time of the pandemic, many communities from different countries are not able to conduct their ritual festival. Due to, okay. Your Buni, you're not hearing you very well. Can you hear me uh, now? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay. So due to the crisis time of pandemic, many communities from different countries are not able to conduct their ritual and festival celebrations. So the preparation of inventory on rituals and festival events will actually help in enhancing the raising of awareness of the social among the younger generation. So in regard, in this regard, an extended pandemic may actually hasten the vanishing of such traditions, which are already losing its appeal among the younger population. So as traditions disappear, so would their meaning. So actually for this proposal with a stronger community participation, this will actually help the community to empower them to document their practice in a more systematic way and help to sustain the rituals and festive in future. Next for the heritage at the core of local economic development strategies is place-based business. Many businesses in heritage areas provide generic products that do not speak to the value of the site because they are only benefiting from the location and custom flow of the site rather than the cultural capital of the site. So it is important to encourage businesses that extract added value from the cultural capital of the site so that they will have the incentive to preserve the tangible and intangible characteristic of heritage. So one example is in the world heritage city of Patan, also known as the Latip Lalitpur in Kathmandu Valley in Nepal, the production of crafts such as metal sculptures, tanka paintings, and several other forms of creative products in a wide, strain, wide range of materials are the key source of livelihood for the local communities. 
So the production of the sculptures are actually needed in the Buddhist temple and practitioners of the faith in Nepal. This actually makes it more sustainable as they are not only depend on the tourists for sales, which also refers to the ecosystem-based intervention in history environment. Next is the use of technology and e-commerce. Local government should assist the local businesses with building online platforms, educating and providing support on how to best utilize the platform and conduct businesses remotely for the local businesses. A proper platform for advertising of local products should also be introduced to local businesses to expand their market to, uh, for example, people outside the World Heritage site or further location. So, as you can see from the photos shown here is uh, one of the business in Georgetown, Penang. Uh, their business is actually last above 100 years, but now they're starting to use the del food delivery apps during the lockdown period in Malaysia. Another one is to promote and develop urban agriculture products and small home business. So in Shiraz historic city, the traditional houses benefit from large courtyard houses where local trees such as oranges and pomegranate grows. These fruit are based for a variety of food and drug products which may inhabitants sell. This process could be organized as a sustainable economic activity in such cities. Next is promote the use of traditional techniques, materials and craftsmanship for conservation of the built urban fabric. Cities in Rajasthan, state of India, such as Jaipur, Udaipur and Ashmir, have a rich repository of traditional craftspeople who work with lime and stone. They are they usually involved in urban conservation work through the government projects. This has helped the improving and upgrading the economy and condition of local skilled craft people while ensuring good conservation work. Next is tax incentive for maintenance and conservation of historic buildings. Private homeowners may be given tax incentive for if they are maintaining their heritage property well. In India, Rajasthan state gives such tax incentive in specific cases around the World Heritage Site areas if the owner are putting their properties to adaptive reuse usage. So this has helped in sustaining the heritage character of the building while providing them enough revenue for its maintenance. So comes into the rethinking urban infrastructure in historic urban context. Uh, the first one is to invest in neighborhood-based public spaces and facilities. So as the pandemic greatly restricted the mobility of people, the public facility at neighborhood level have become more important. For example, we can use the public space as a neighborhood green spaces for delivery services uh, and also for community gardens. So one of the examples shown here is the Siaboy Urban Archaeological Park in Georgetown. So we uh, actually revived this abandoned space into a urban archaeological park which served to the local community to be the stress reliever space during the pandemic. So next one is improved infrastructures for home-based businesses. All around the world, municipalities provide places for flexible temporary offer of small home-based businesses, especially for specific events such as New Year festivals. So during COVID-19 pandemic, this actually taught us to provide appropriate internet and electricity facilities for the use of historic city inhabitants to organize online platforms such as conditions. Next is HIA report should be the mandatory and policy adoption for ban on infrastructure works if it impacts the heritage if significance of OUV. So infrastructure works especially related to transport such as roads, bridges or railways have been found damaging in various historic contexts. The case studies in Jaipur World Heritage City, Rajasthan show both positive cases where a highway was diverted from heritage precinct and negative cases where Metro had some impact on the heritage attributes during the implementation. Hence a strong policy to ensure that no such infrastructure projects should be taken up without the HIA is essential. 
Next one is the adaptation of infrastructure to the historic city dimensions, but not the city to the conventional infrastructure. So um, the local, the, the historic area have attributes and challenges which set them apart from modern day development developed areas. The interventions in these areas providing infrastructure must be innovative in its approach aligned with the SDGs. Ecologically and socially sensitive principles should inform interventions in these areas such as bioremediation for treating waste, use of constructed wetlands to treat wastewater, solar energy or processes of social interventions. So in conclusion, for post night post-COVID-19 strategy, the scenario of pandemic or epidemic should be included in the management plans of heritage site. So next is to prepare for alternative ways of community practice. Review if heritage attributes of your city can contribute to managing of the pandemic. Identify, reward and engage the civil society organizations community groups and individuals who actively engage in disaster management during COVID-19 to demonstrate the community resilience. The next is internet-based management platforms can be created to better manage heritage sites in terms of tourist flow, information dissemination, and so on. Development of home business and develop the, to develop the local tourism through outreach and educational activities is also essential. Last but not least is to encourage loyal and long-term custodianship in heritage cities. That's all for me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. This was extremely thorough given the very short time. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, perhaps we'll come back to your teammates once uh, we have the open session. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, now we move to Group C. Group C, please go ahead. Um, hello there, it's Edmonty. Um, we had a number of technical issues, so unfortunately our group didn't do the kind of work we needed to do, but uh, I'm going to share uh, a few points and then ask my colleagues to, to jump in as needed. Um, can you give me a second, please? Can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so the so the group uh, the group consisted of a number of Southern African, Sub-Saharan, Southern African uh, members, and we come from uh, Kenya, Zimbabwe, um, and Eritrea and South Africa. So we're just going to give one slide with a few points and my colleagues will jump in as needed. Um, so the first one, um, so the, the general point is about uh, how we work with the formal and the informal. So the first point uh, is around public space and its adaptability for use. Um, and we have examples from uh, Lamu and Asmara, but I will ask my colleague uh, from Lamu to speak, uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, and basically here we looked at issues of colonial infrastructure versus local traditions, as well as the issues of influence and opportunities of international donors and partners. Um, Mohamed Ali, would you like to give your input, please? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I don't know if I should share, share my screen now, if it's possible. But it's essentially, we, we looked at uh, two examples uh, from LAMU uh, in response to the community uh, practice in urban heritage areas, uh, where we looked at uh, the Maulidi Festival and where it is actually conducted. Uh, this is an imp uh, important festival uh, which is almost 100 years old, and it is performed at the uh, Ma Maulidi grounds. It attracts visitors from all over the globe. Um, uh, the grounds are maintained actually by the local community, uh, even though once in a while they get assistance from uh, 
uh, donors or the government. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, the practice that is, uh, takes place on the grounds is being challenged by new ways of thinking. Uh, some people think that the entire concept of Maulid is, is actually an innovation and it has nothing to do with religion. Uh, so it, it stands a chance of uh, probably in future uh, losing its uh, significance. And then we looked at the Lamu fort uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, creating new spaces uh, or, or rehabilitation of, in terms of, of rethinking uh, infrastructure. Uh, Lamu fort, which I would have loved to share with you. Uh, where is it? Uh, anyway, uh, Lamu fort and the public grounds just in front of it were a market and a prison for many years. So in 1985, uh, there was this massive program to try and improve the place, uh, convert it into a social cultural center and a, a public open space. Uh, it received a lot of, uh, some kind of don uh, funding from uh, the Swedish government and uh, an architect was appointed and he worked with the local community uh, towards rehabilitating that space. Uh, today, it's actually the most uh, prominent public open space in town. Um, and the fort, uh, in addition to hosting uh, a public library, the only one in the island, it also hosts uh, major uh, functions. So in this case, we see that uh, actually the rehabilitation, the, the, the adaptive reuse of those two facilities have greatly contributed to the HOU of the site. Thank you very much. So um, the, the next point that we had was around intangible heritage. Um, and, and it should be noted that uh, in a number of our instances, we actually do not have World Heritage mm -hmm. sites, in, in, uh, for example, Zimbabwe and, uh, and in South Africa. So we were trying to work with some, some issues related to intangible heritage. Question about who's, why, and how, the use of alternative approaches, such as digital and social distancing, um, we ask questions such as how do different conventions speak to each other? And we spoke about policies and governance systems that support, especially talking about the importance of evidence based approaches. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Nyati to speak a bit on these issues. Uh, thank you very much, Zaid and Mohammed. Um, right, mine is also to buttress the submissions by my colleagues and using the case of Lamo as my point of departure, what emerged to us is the need for multi-stakeholderism in terms of the various UNESCO, UNESCO conventions speaking to each other. Uh, Lamo is a historic open space, but within that historic open space, you find that there are festivals that have been introduced so to, uh, to us, what that meant was that there is a need for stakeholders across the different conventions to complement their efforts. Because the moment you speak about festivals, that now constitutes intangible cultural heritage, which is a different UNESCO convention. But the idea is, from a governance perspective, stakeholders across the different conventions must congregate and plan together collectively and uh, deviate from what can easily be a silo approach when approaching the conventions. So that is the strategy for element number one. Then in as far as strategy two, in how we develop infrastructure for community well-being, what we pondered on was digital space as spaces for community engagement into the future. And this particularly speaks to uh, the COVID era, while other sectors of the economy are reopening, the culture sector is most likely to be one of the last sectors to be reopened. Uh, thinking ahead, what components of the creative value chain can be digitized and be accessed online? And we looked, for instance, at craft making, 
uh, it is indeed possible to conceptualize ideas while sitting at home. You can produce the product while sitting at home and then maybe the digitization can come when the product is done and you now need to promote it. That is when you can then use digital platforms and then post to prospective uh, buyers. So to what extent can digital spaces be leveraged to support specific components of the creative value chain using the example of craft making? Then in terms of uh, strategy three, uh, how does heritage you know, facilitate sustainable uh, use of urban heritage areas. What we've seen happening uh, in some jurisdictions is, um, you know, promotion of township tourism. And this again facilitates community engagement through job creation for people who are domiciled in those particular communities. They're engaged as talkers, talkers to narrate the history and the heritage of their locality. So there's a need to strengthen that so that they derive economic value from their heritage and they are better incentivized, therefore, to look after uh, that heritage. In as far as alternative financing is concerned, what we discussed was uh, uh, cases that we've seen, for instance, uh, in the case of uh, my local authority, we are not a historic open space, uh, we struck it with those case studies, at least in our context from where we come from. So we tried to then just look for historical value and not just outstanding universal value. Uh, the ring fencing concept, which has been adopted by some local authorities to support art, culture, and heritage, to say, for instance, from uh, the sum total of our resources, we will dedicate 0.5 or 1% towards arts, culture, and heritage. And that facilitates cultural expression in the townships where the people stay, so as to promote social cohesion and inclusion and identity making, which ultimately speaks to identity making for the respective cities. Uh, then, uh, post COVID 19, what is apparent to us in the sub-Saharan context is that the precarity and the fragility of heritage will be heightened. Uh, incomes have been lost, and in the order of rankings, having analyzed the various nation states' responses, culture is always one of the lower rung, you know, uh, institutions, spaces that are financed. So we see even more people uh, dropping out of the sector, you know, failing to look after their heritage as they prioritize other commitments that can give them immediate income streams. But the alternative from our considerations are that there is a need to invest in the building of endowment funds. You know, uh, these are reserved funds for rainy days such as these ones. That's a possible intervention. Then again, there were various interventions need funding availed by private or government actors, but many of our craft people and other players are highly informalized in our context. It then becomes a challenge to access funding, uh, such as COVID-19 support, because people are not registered with any state entities and they do not have any records to showcase that indeed this is what they do. So there's a need to support formalization of practice, particularly in the craft sector. So that is the long and short of the submission. I, I can then give Zaid to do the summary. Thank you so much, Niati. Um, I, I, we started dealing with some of the other issues. <clears throat> so some of the points that we started to talk about were management plans and the need for these to be formalized and developed up front. And I think this was raised earlier. <clears throat> the idea of uh, um, management plans that are signed and sealed up front and being able to be implemented through different partners, state and non-state is quite important. And the example was used of Cape Town and the uh, improvement district that is used to, to work with the city in <clears throat> addressing some challenges. Excuse me, I'm having a bit of a problem. Um, and then finally, we started to touch on issues of collaborative governance, which is uh, looking at issues of how to formalize the question of participation 
And there's quite a lot of literature that uh, can be drawn on. And we started to talk uh, about these things, which we'll, we'll carry on uh, dealing with. Uh, some issues around leadership, uh, appropriate institutional design, but also recognizing resource asymmetries that exist between <clears throat> state and local players and how these can be supported through appropriate models of coll collaborative governance, uh, bringing together state and non-state actors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very, very rich. I uh, really appreciate uh, that all you've managed to work despite all the technical difficulties. I hope that with the extra time we can help resolve some of the technical issues and that will give you time to make work instead of having to work on teams perhaps separately and bring it together. But we'll be happy to support uh, whatever way we can uh, to enable the group to uh, continue your work a little bit more uh, over the next two weeks. But thank you very much for, these, uh, for sharing these, these different ideas and opportunities and options. Um, I do want to be able to comment a couple of the things that have been raised, but I'm going to hold off uh, until we finish with Group D. So over now to Group D. Hi, Jyoti. Uh, this is Rami Bahe. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, can you see it? Yes, we see it. Perfectly. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, we are Group D, um, Riham Aram from Egypt, Adnan bin Nijma from Tunis, Iman Bilani from Morocco, myself, Rami Bahir from Jordan, uh, Abdurrahim Kassou from Morocco, uh, Ms. Bahrajab from uh, Lebanon, uh, Sana Niyar from Egypt, uh, Maya Rafia from Lebanon, and Heidi Shalabi from Egypt. Okay. Um, First of all, before we start and talk about the various strategies, uh, we felt that our group is mainly divided between the Mashriq and the Maghreb. The Mashriq is like in the east of the Arab world, uh, countries like Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, and Syria, and so on. And also in the Maghreb, uh, like you know, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunis, and then also there is Egypt in the middle. We just wanted to make clear that in the Maghreb and with an earlier attention to historic cities, conservation, uh, government's support and involvement is much more advanced than in, in the Mashra. Uh, therefore, historic cities like Rabat, uh, the old city of Tunis, and so on, uh, benefited a lot from governmental support or royal support and are able to implement holistic, comprehensive strategies and uh, preservation uh, on many levels. Uh, while in the Mashra, more and more uh, governmental support is much minimal. Uh, and the attention has recently only started to uh, to be geared towards urban conservation and historic cities. And so far, we've been depending a lot on uh, uh, private initiatives, philanthropic, patronage, and so on and so forth. Um, having said that, we're going to move to the uh, uh, basic uh, also concepts that we found as common themes. The strong relationship between social cohesion community engagement, uh, intangible heritage, and the heritage-based income-generating activities. This is regarding uh, the first strategies. This is something that came up with the case studies. And the role of civil society and NGOs as driving force for heritage preservation. And the need for these types of private and organic activities or initiatives uh, to be supported and framed uh, by municipalities and governments. Um, we move on, on the first strategy, basically, which talked about uh, uh, community participation and participation in general, and also talked about, uh, basically, uh, uh, community uh, uh, participatory uh, 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 approaches. Uh, and uh, we, I bring example from uh, SALT, uh, which is a city in, in Jordan, uh, it's not on the world heritage, uh, but it's a sort that, that it's a city with, with strong links between tangible and intangible uh, attributes, uh, such as you know the urban uh, uh, heritage, the public spaces, the architecture, but also tolerance and cohabitation amongst different religious communities within the city, urban hospitality, and so on and so forth. 
And uh, the practice, the community practice in, these, in this urban heritage area that we want to uh, concentrate on, even though at first glance it might be uh, seen as something not that important and that happens everywhere, uh, but in this particular location, it takes on different forms, uh, which is the uh, tolerance and continuous tolerance, symbiosis and support between Muslim and Christian communities within the, the city that takes on different uh, forms, uh, religious festivals, sharing responsibilities, brotherhood and fraternity, shared businesses, joining together in the veneration and visitation of local saints at the same time, such as St. George, uh, Church of St. George, which is the Church of al Khadr. Uh, Prophet uh, uh, Yusha, which is, for example, the biblical Joshua, and so on. And in general, both Muslims and Christians communities use these spaces together within the urban historic core, uh, such as the churches, the visitation of the shrines, and so on. And also, uh, public events take on uh, uh, the various public spaces, such as uh, the uh, uh, commercial traditional streets and the various plazas of the city. Uh, now, why, why is this uh, practice in particular, uh, we're talking about strategy one, uh, extremely important for the heritage identity of the place? Now, uh, we just want to briefly elaborate that even though this tolerance does exist in many other cities, but in this particular location, it takes on uh, different uh, forms and intensity. So in terms of intensity, but also in terms of continuity of such traditions into the future, and also the fact that this particular city does not have a, a, a segregation between neighborhoods uh, by set. So, I mean, everybody lives next to each other. Uh, uh, so I think we feel that in this particular case, this example presents a very important uh, uh, example of these community practices. The other example very quickly comes from the city of Tripoli in Lebanon. Uh, and this is a very important historic city. Uh, during uh, Ramadan, which is a religious uh, uh, month for, for Muslims, uh, the city uh, is completely transformed through religious festivals uh, and also all sorts of different events that deal with, uh, 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 that are somehow religious in nature, but they attract all sorts of different communities to the historic city center, which in a sense also, also provides a lot of uh, 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 venues for also economic development for the local community. We move now to the second strategy, basically, um, and uh, with the second strategy, we want to talk more about uh, economic opportunities. Uh, uh, the common threads that we found that the, the projects adopt a holistic approach to serve the local community and goes beyond beautification or infrastructure that only serves tourism. This is something that is very important. And also there is a focus on engaging the community and or developing participatory tools uh, and also building infrastructure to directly serve uh, the community. So uh, for this particular example, we talk about uh, the historic uh, part of Cairo. You're muted now, Rami. You somehow got muted. We don't hear you yet. Yeah, sorry, but okay. yeah, you can hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. The project of the upgrading of this historic city, which is Al Muayyad Street in the historic core, uh, is very essential in helping local communities to use the street as a main commercial spy and also protect the historic buildings uh, from, deterioration, from deterioration. Also encourage the local community to make activities in the public spaces and make the street more appropriate to, look, to host cultural events and uh, also festivals. Uh, moving on. So we're still with, within the second strategy, developing local infrastructure for the community well-being. Uh, so within within the street, where we, we can observe uh, you know various cultural events, uh, uh, art exhibits, and and the effect actually uh, this these ideas attracts both you know tourists and local Egyptians from other cities as well. Uh, per, hence you know permitting exhibitions of handicrafts and all sorts of different activities uh, within the city. Rami, could we ask you to just move it along a little bit? Yeah, a little bit faster. 
A little bit faster, please. Good. Thank you. I will. I will. Okay. Um, one last example for, um, on this strategy comes from the city of Wahran uh, in Algeria, which is a school for, of traditional building trades. Uh, you know, uh, it addresses various uh, uh, problematics such as vulnerable local communities, uh, uh, need for cultural facilities, and a specialized workforce in built heritage uh, uh, restoration. So this school actually uh, uh, worked on the reduction of unemployment, uh, fostering also social cohesion, and also reviving historical urban areas, and direct impact on heritage conservation, of course. Uh, this is more uh, on the school in terms of its background and uh, key learning outputs uh, of the school uh, in Wahran. Okay, uh, also uh, Rabat, uh, which is a very important case. Uh, it benefits from a strategic vision for the preservation of its historic area uh, and its buffer zone uh, in terms of also the well-being of, uh, of its local communities at many levels, at an institutional level, at a legal level, and also at a special level of uh, spatial level, uh, signage and trails and what have you. And also at an infrastructure level in terms of accessibility, uh, triangular, uh, transportation, restoration, uh, urban spaces, and so on. And uh, basically, uh, uh, the city, moving very quickly, to, uh, the next uh, uh, strategies. Uh, and here we are talking about economic, new investment and economic opportunities. Uh, the common threads that we found, mar uh, markets often uh, serve uh, the local community with daily products, uh, selling more uh, than uh, decorative products. Uh, high potential when we adapt fast to the e-commerce and digital marketing. Uh, when uh, we can learn a lot from successful private community-led NGO uh, led initiatives, especially when the projects stem from the clear market study for promoting sustainable economic development and includes training and education for communities. Uh, so for this particular example in strategy three, uh, the example comes from Beirut and from Lebanon and also different parts of Lebanon, which is so tired, which is a basic community uh, practice that uh, contributes to the unique historical identity of most Arab communities. So this notion of the culture of food, and the aim is to uh, cooperative, uh, the cooperative intentionally spans Lebanon regions, basically, uh, and works, uh, makes, uh, its aim is to give livelihood to small-scale farmers, so it actually creates very strong links between the hinterland and the historic cores of cities, and marginalized home, market, home workers as well, uh, to enhance food knowledge and culture throughout uh, Lebanese cities. Uh, this is a private initiative, uh, that receives also funding from other uh, agencies. So this is a very special example of uh, this heritage-based economic strategies uh, for the sustainable conservation of urban areas. And it's definitely a success story uh, that connects stakeholders together, uh, activate parts of the city, promote appreciation, uh, revive local farming, uh, peacemaking as well. And it is expanding rapidly into different forms like restaurants, grocery stores, cooking schools, and what have you. Uh, another example uh, comes from Rabat, uh, which is basically, um, it, Rabat more or less also has different activities. And here in particular, the, the festivals, the cultural activities uh, that are existing in the historic core and in the buffer zone, and the music festivals that actually enhance uh, 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 the local economic opportunities for the community is lucrative, they're very lucrative, create jobs and opportunities, and also uh, uh, basically uh, they create also social cohesion. Uh, the example, for example, many is, is the Moazim uh, uh, Festival for music uh, in Rabat. Moving quickly, and also another example for this strategy comes from uh, Egypt and the handicraft uh, online uh, uh, platform uh, uh, from Historic uh, Cairo. Uh, this activity is practiced by craftsmen who run their own businesses, whether it is modest or big, basically. 
Uh, Creative Egypt uh, is an initiative that helps the craftsmen to sell their original products uh, on an online portal managed and protected uh, by the government. It helps to promote Egyptian handicrafts. Um, to move quickly to uh, other examples, this is basically uh, uh, just a, a picture of historic Cairo and the handicrafts. An example on alternative financing. We move to the next strategy, uh, the common grounds, a positive impact of, pro of projects that recognize the existing natural and cultural features of the site and positive role of community-led uh, development. So within the last assignment, uh, that talks about uh, 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 infrastructure and innovative uh, infrastructure uh, with positive and negative examples. The example comes from Saiba, uh, Urban Sustainable Development Strategy for Lebanon. Uh, the, the, it's a city, it's a Mediterranean coastal city in Lebanon, but also an agricultural city. The waterfront, uh, uh, old railway roads, rivers, and streams are alive in the collective memory as a source of life. Uh, today, uh, inadequate urban infrastructure, uh, dumping of sewage into the uh, watercourses, solid waste uh, forming a hill in the historic city. Both the municipality and residents of Saiba play a limited role uh, to actually address this issue. But um, uh, with, this, with this very important uh, initiative, uh, which is the, the Green Blue uh, Network recognizes the environmental resources, the ecosystem and the urban landscape heritage. Uh, the Green Blue uh, Network includes different parts of the municipal area and increases the per capita green area allocation uh, from uh, uh, 3.2 meters square per capita to 7.42 meters square per capita. And also funding is from the municipality, but also collaboration with uh, other uh, entities. Um, on this notion of also infrastructure, there are negative examples. They're not completely negative, but a group of cities in like within Lebanon, Jordan, and so on, have received a lot of funding from the World Bank uh, to targeting urban conservation and urban uh, tourism within the prevention small cities, uh, like, for example, uh, Saida, Tripoli, Sur in Lebanon, Tara uh, Ajlun in Jordan. Now, a lot of problems with these projects is that instead of them concentrating on a comprehensive uh, example of urban conservation working with communities and working on infrastructure, they, co they end up uh, with primarily cosmetic urban conservation, like tiling of uh, uh, alleyways and like uh, urban furniture, even though this is important, but then uh, 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 a lot of effort is not targeting uh, the local communities. And the last uh, strategy, which is um, also innovative, uh, uh, strategies for decade area. Very quickly, the example comes from Hafsiya, which is also a world heritage city um, uh, in Tunis, uh, where there has been uh, different investment opportunities uh, organized by the government, by uh, uh, the local organization that takes care of the historic city, uh, into uh, innovative infrastructure provision, but also uh, uh, urban conservation that brings back and conserves the residential mixed use also uh, character of the city and particularly concentrates on uh, residential. Uh, this is an area that was uh, suffering from major decay and after this very important project, uh, uh, it, it, it actually transformed. The last thing, the last slide, uh, uh, is about COVID-19, and we have some observations. Even though the uh, repercussions of the pandemic, uh, uh, pandemic on the tangible and intangible heritage are not major on the long run, attention should be paid on those in the community who lost their daily income. Uh, because there's a lot of community that actually works from one day to another in terms of their income, very fragile communities. One solution can be a governmental aid or tax exemption. Opportunity for new understanding of tourism, different forms of tourism, and for better engagement with the local community, especially the most vulnerable. Uh, different forms of tourism could be also incorporating and encouraging local tourism, and also intersections between the hinterland and the historic core. 
opportunity to revisit infrastructure plans in order to tackle environmental issues like uh, congestion, pollution, traffic in historic areas? And how often uh, do we integrate communities in decision making? Uh, and for how long? Long-term continuous active engagement with the local community through various uh, channels and methods build uh, trust and collective intelligence. And finally, learn from creative and uh, disruptive solutions uh, uh, and also especially in cities that lack governmental and municipal uh, support. Uh, so this is where we can actually look into other alternative economic uh, models for investment like patronage and... Uh, Sorry, we really need to move it along, Dami. So if you could please wrap up. Sure. Uh, I'm done. This is the last slide, actually. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. Sorry, it took longer, uh, but we wanted to actually give more information about the case studies as much as possible. Thank you very much. No, I didn't mean to cut you short at all, uh, because this, you know, we, we keep asking for people to come back with your, your ideas, your thoughts. And to me, this is the best way where you have put your thoughts and your ideas together and you're sharing them. So it's, it's what this is about, Lab is about. Mm -hmm. So we're very, very grateful for the amount of energy, effort, work that has gone into uh, developing uh, these these different strategies and solutions. I think it's just marvelous. So we're very excited, very thrilled. Um, we actually have, uh, we have a sort of overload of excellent ideas and thoughts today, uh, but that was the purpose because the idea was that we sort of saturate ourselves in a way with all of these ideas and somehow out of cool drawn, we will have magical solutions. So part of the magic today, uh, most important in some ways, uh, is to talk about resilience and sustainability. And we have uh, two session leads who are going to talk about these issues and then lead us into our final discussion uh, so that we can really focus on some of the ideas in addition to all the points that have been raised so far. So I'm going to not share too much about my thoughts that I wanted to, to touch upon. Maybe I'll save it for the end and then um, turn it over now to Lassa Sisse. Uh, no, I think it's Michael. Sorry, Michael Turner. Please go ahead. Michael is no stranger to any, any of us here. He's uh, been sort of a long-standing uh, contributor to the work we are doing on World Heritage and Cities. Uh, uh, is he's now an uh, emeritus professor, I believe, uh, although Michael never retires. Uh, at, he's the chair of the Betzalel, uh, the, the UNESCO chair, he holds the UNESCO chair at Betzalel Academy of, of uh, Architecture. Michael, over to you. We need to hear your voice, Michael. Yep. There's, okay, thank you, Jyoti, and thank you uh, for such uh, an incredible opening. Uh, I find that I've, uh, in trying to put everything together, um, it is uh, an enormous challenge, uh, but it's trying to look at the exciting sessions which we've had over the past um, uh, two weeks um, and uh, try to put some context and a summary which will allow us then to um, show a way forward. Uh, I think my challenge is being shared by Lorena Perez, who is also being the rapporteur. So I think that, first of all, just to uh, look at the four subjects that were being presented, one of that of resilience and recovery, which um, uh, Lasana, my colleague, will speak uh, later on, and then the second one being the well-being and local communities, the third of the local economic development, and four was the infrastructure. And in fact, we put together four of the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that of 3, 11, 8, and 9. I think it's useful just to keep them in mind because we're beginning to put them together and be able to understand a wider context. And I think that obviously in the next lab, we'll take several, so another few uh, of these goals. But in fact, where we need to do is, where, where are we, what are our marching orders within the UNESCO framework within the World Heritage Convention? 
I think uh, based on the uh, further of the historic urban landscape recommendation, the most important document was in fact the preparation of UNESCO Culture Urban Future, which was prepared for the 2016 UN Habitat New Urban Agenda. This uh, put exactly urban heritage, and I think that the decision of the General Conference regarding the future of the historic urban landscape brought together the new urban agenda and activities in Africa. And this looked at two main aspects. That was a global survey which then looked at regional aspects. And the other one was then sustainable cities, a thematic approach, which looked at people, environment, and policies. But let's look at what we're really facing. We were told, in fact, we've actually seen that the UN, in fact, has put in revising its world urbanization prospects, wrote that by about 2040, two thirds of the world may be living in cities. I say this is not correct. It's more accurate to say, if the current trend continues, then by 2040, almost two thirds of the world may be living in cities as we define now. So there's two factors that we need to sort of look into and consider. One is that we don't have to deal with trends. We can change trends. Look what COVID-19 did for us. It really had a disruptive, innovative potential, which we have to look at. And the other one is then how do we define our cities? They're no longer by a traffic sign which says you're now in built-up area. It is now much more, which I'll also speak about, the COVID-19. But so therefore, what we're actually having now in the urban heritage is that it's a shift from the architectural monuments for the broader recognition of social, cultural, economic, and other practices, which were defined in the recommendation of the historic urban landscape. And I say, with the opportunities and challenges of tomorrow, we cannot solve the urban problems of today with the architectural tools of yesterday. And I think that what I want to speak in the short uh, presentation is that we have to have a rethink and a restart after COVID-19. Uh, how we manage urban heritage is not how we manage then the uh, heritage which are in monuments. So I'm just going to look at some of the strategies and the recommendations which you all came up with. In fact, I've actually put little drawings from my sketchbook, my notebook, which I took over the past book. Sorry, which I took over the past four, um, four sessions. So my first one sort of looks really at the public realm. You can see here the public realm, which was really a most important part which we all dealt with. Look at the nolly, the public realm beyond the doors, beyond the space. And then also we have then definition of the theater of space, the Renaissance understanding which Carlo explained to us and which then generated greenway systems. We have new systems which can then de 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 uh, actually deal with sequences which uh, were taken on board by Daniel Pini. So these sequences actually move over into sustainable space and to seeing therefore that the historic urban landscape is beyond the uh, ensemble, beyond the city and including therefore the sustainable areas in uh, the hinterland. And the last bit, therefore, is actually what I would call urban acupuncture. This is the proposals which you've come up with, which are so great. Many times, a small effect in a particular point will then develop, then affect a large areas within our historic areas. And these are through urban attributes, bicycle parks, pocket parks, access, crafts and arts, and all these wonderful things that you've actually spoken about. And Sairiubo of the Africa World Heritage Fund spoke about adaptive reuse. And these are the issues which create new values. If the value is in the use, we've lost the value. But we have new values. We have values which then transcend, therefore, uses and the importance of continuity. But the cultural mapping also goes within the COVID-19. It's We have to then say how this can then be uh, useful for other activities as well. And the most important thing was governance. The governance then looked into local empowerment, the actual civil society and digital power, which we actually related to and Group A mentioned. 
It's the interest groups, it's communities, it's the marginal groups, it's youth. The youth are going to present now in Africa and the most amazing um, co um, confrontation of urban heritage in the next 20 years. And we need to be bottom up. Place specific solutions so generated by, by Group A, the community based inventory of Group B, and the driving force of the civil societies of Group D. I think this then moves us into the problems of the World Bank seeing projects as opposed to the local people seeing process. And it was national investment versus then local expenditure and how we can have outstanding universal value for outstanding local value and the local value not being pushed out by the universal value, which was then spoken about. And it's new economies, and the new economies is not just build back better, but building society better. And in fact, as Russell has uh, uh, actually mentioned, it is bouncing forward. The last two parts, moving together these uh, sections, is in fact to look at communities. It's the plural of community, not to use the singular. The virtual, the real, the diasporic communities are all part of what is happening. It is that also looks at Article 5 in the life of the community, which we're actually dealing with. We're also then um, managing the issues of the community of happiness and well-being, the trust and humility which is needed. And we heard from uh, Ang that it is people, nature and the spirituality. And this we've spoken about the layering which Liz spoke about and spoke of the historic urban landscape must be actually complemented with the issues of continuity, layering and continuity moving together with sequences of spaces and events. Then this all brought together with networks and systems and then finally having culture for sustainable development. In my last drawing for my sketchbook, it then is looking at the historic um, center, but in fact, the idea then of a buffer zone is really problematic. We want to have an added layer of protection, yes, but it is beyond the, the center. It goes beyond and creating then the guidelines for a general aspects. I'm a little bit nervous about the historic heritage impact assessment, very suitable for monuments. I think that it is very problematic for urban heritage. It is a, a reactive tool. We have to use proactive tools of the strategic environmental assessment. We have to see heritage as an integral part of environment. The EU has demanded or said that heritage is part of the environment as opposed to then a silo, one alone approach. This just puts us into a situation of them and us. No. It is culture for sustainable development. Perhaps it's running with the devil, but I think that this is something, a challenge, which we have to do. It is managing change, but it is also not of management plans, but in the, in the situation of urban heritage, management systems. And I think that this, it will move us forward a lot. So in summary, I try to put together, and this could be used later on for, your ne uh, for the next two weeks, as Jyoti had said, is that it brought them together with governance, urban heritage and sustainable development, the digital technologies, the integrative processes, financing, risk and resilience, which Lasano will speak about. And therefore, I would say there are six main messages. Social transformations. Very few people are living in the place that they were born in. Enormous movement of people around the world. Sustainable economic growth, the integrative city, linking nature and culture, capacity building and dissemination, and the digital revolution. In a webinar I participated in, uh, Jean-Louis Carsana actually spoke and said that in another 50 years, people will look back and say how primitive these people were with their smartphones. So, the way forward, beyond the historic ensemble, to take out the idea of buffer zone and use the historic urban landscape to have a broader urban context and geographic settings, to use all the attributes of topography, geomorphology, hydrology, and natural features which the historic urban landscape gives, rather than a simple visual aspect, 
which also uh, Adnan also spoke about uh, over the past sessions in zoning and the problem of the third, di third dimension. We need an integrative city and not the silo approaches spoken uh, that World Heritage is often not a whole city. The Vatican, yes, San Marino, most of it, they're just parts of a city. How do we then provide an integrative approach, add benefit to the rest of the city? We then have to have community and identity. The COVID-19 has said, okay, we need to have the 15-minute city, the way forward. Things can happen close by, and then we can bring things together, which is really part and parcel of the local identity. We need to understand innovation and cooling the city. In other words, economic cooling. We take off the heat of the city of large-scale development. And in, La in the port city of Lamu, we saw the informal settlements outside, which could be quite good. It takes the heat off a lot of the area of the center rather than actually dealing with other areas. But more important is the digital revolution. It's not just being a smart city. But what the technologies have shifted centralized hierarchies to distributed networks. It's empowered individuals rather than external hierarchies. And this is a major issue which we have to take on board. This is a challenge which we, within the system, have to then harness to actually bring. You all spoke about the digital technologies, how it helped them to move new marketing, new e-ideas, and these things. This we have to then really take off with. The last bit deals with nature and culture and uh, dealing with the issues of uh, protected areas, but it's not just simply nature and culture. It is an integrative process by which we can take on board not the greenways in Florence, but in fact, actually looking at how there is an urban sponges, an urban sponge for people, for issues, for flooding, for other activities which are taking place. It is then the sustainability of the market gardening, which takes place just outside the, the city. And the city then has now new definitions, as I said, of the space. I'd like to also speak about language and culture. We tend to become Eurocentric and unfortunately Anglocentric as well. It is the new Latin of the era. It is the new Aramaic of the areas. And we should then think about how, in fact, we can then use the cultures of the Shan Shui in China. In other words, I would call it the historic urban Shan Shui. The, and we have to then understand exactly that the qualities of the Shan Shui and the poetry add so much to exactly what we can understand. And it is not a one-way north-south, south-north. It is circular knowledge. We have to then expand on this idea of circular knowledge. We could go on to other aspects which Asia, with its wonderful culture, can then um, bring to bear and uh, uh, ensure that we have better understanding of the cultural significance of tangible and intangibility. So people raise the issue of the conflict between universal and local values. We raise the issue of smart protection, of surveillance, rights of privacy. These are major issues. I don't have a Google account yet. Uh, digital platforms, uh, the size of the city and the World Heritage Fragment, exactly how does this relate to it? The changes in transformation modes, the climate extremes. I prefer to use that rather than climate change. We, there are other people dealing with climate change better equipped than we are. But we deal with climate extremes. What happens when there's flooding? What the, how, does this, how do we deal with this? Managing heritage in crisis, we've got to then distill from the COVID-19 what is then going to be relevant for other things as well. If we say, oh, COVID-19, then mayor will then say, it shouldn't happen on my, on my watch. But if we can find that COVID-19 could understand, better understand crisis, cri other crises and other aspects of resilience will get better understanding. Social justice and just cities, physical distancing and social engagement, and the main thing is a change of mindset about culture for sustainable development. We have to have a new paradigm and move away from the issue of not just simply we're preserving monuments, but we're doing, and the challenge which all of you have said is then being in a living city. Let me just end with a piece of poetry, and that is with Brecht. Brecht I love. They're, they're always city poets in lots of um, cultures. 
He wrote about the way to construct enduring works. Think about the city. How long do works endure? As long as they are not completed. Since as long as they demand effort, they do not decay. Inviting further work, repaying participation, their being lasts as long as they invite and reward. I think this is a wonderful support for urban heritage and use of the city. Jyoti asked said that we should need to open up the debate. Sorry, that was finished, just to open up the debate. And I think that you've actually uh, done what I thought that you might be doing because you've already done it. It's the most incredible. Propose that one recommendation that you considered during the World Heritage Lab in the fields that, and who may be its champion. I think you've in fact uh, preempted me and done it so wonderfully. And thank you very much. I've learned so much from you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, indeed, it's, uh, it's astonishing uh, how much has been processed so quickly in this very short time. Clearly, there's a reason why you're all experts and you're all here together. Um, I'm, I want to invite now um, uh, Lasana Sise, an anthropologist, a uh, heritage specialist, uh, who has worked as a site manager in um, Bandiagara in Mali for a number of years and, and other World Heritage Sites, and uh, has been the national uh, director for World Heritage uh, uh, in Mali for a number of years. Uh, Lasana, over to you. We're delighted to have you. Merci beaucoup, Jyoti. Merci à à tout le monde, euh, comme vient de dire euh, mon ami Mike, Michael, euh, on a tous euh, vraiment beaucoup appris et la rencontre, enfin, les, les ateliers ont été très participatifs, euh, toutes les régions ont participé, donc merci pour ça. Alors, moi, mon propos va concerner le thème qui, au départ, a suscité ce, cet atelier, c'est-à-dire patrimoine, euh, un fondement du relèvement de la résilience dans les villes. Pour être très précis et conçu, nos propos concernent donc les, les villes inscrites sur la liste du patrimoine mondial et les paysages urbains historiques. Et il se trouve que la crise euh, qui est aussi à l'origine de cet atelier, la crise de COVID-19, a impacté toutes les villes, directement ou indirectement, toutes les villes, même celles qui ne sont pas patrimoine, surtout celles qui ne sont pas patrimoine mondial. Et il y a des conséquences énormes. On a beaucoup parlé au cours de notre rencontre de, de l'effondrement du tourisme. Hein, et une nouvelle vie qui, avec la, les distanciations, les mesures euh, barrières, les espaces ont été connaissent un nouveau mode de vie, les populations vivant dans ces villes. Et donc, ces crises-là ont véritablement impacté les sites de ces villes. Mais, dans ce cadre, les gens sont obligés de, de s'organiser et réfléchir comment sortir, euh, développer des mécanismes de résilience, de résistance, pour faire face à ces défis. Parce qu'il n'y a pas que la crise, de, on parle actuellement de la crise de, de, de COVID-19, parce qu'il y a d'autres crises. Je parle de mon cas au Mali, si on est dans la région de Sahel, nous vivons la crise, une crise sécuritaire grave depuis 2012, qui a donc euh, eu des effets énormes sur euh, l'économie du tourisme, le secteur euh, du tourisme est exsangue, sur des sites au Mali par exemple, les sites du patrimoine mondial, les villes. Jenny Tombouctou était l'épicentre du tourisme. Depuis cette période, il y a eu beaucoup de difficultés. Donc, mon propos va se <coughs> tourner autour de ça. Et qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire avec, euh, avec euh, cet impact du Covid Alors, il y a la crise. Mais la crise, euh, je l'ai dit tantôt, elle n'est pas que celle sanitaire, hein, c'est-à-dire euh, Covid-19. C'est une crise multidimensionnelle. Il y a la crise environnementale, la crise du climat, la crise, la crise sanitaire et la crise sécuritaire. 
la crise sécuritaire, le cas de Tombouctou, je vais vous dire un cas qui va vous édifier. Alors, Tombouctou a été brutalement frappé par la crise sanitaire. Il y a la crise sécuritaire depuis 2012. L'UNESCO a mobilisé la communauté internationale, pour vous savez, pour répondre sur les mausolées, mettre en l'état le patrimoine. Mais ce qui est arrivé, c'est que la pandémie du de COVID-19, euh, la pandémie COVID-19 a frappé la ville d'un coup parce que il y a dans cette ville les forces internationales, la MINUSMA, qui est là pour assurer la sécurité, pour résoudre la crise sécuritaire. Et cette, euh, cette euh, organisation des Nations Unies emploie actuellement 400, 400 jeunes de la ville de Tombouctou parce que les camps se trouvent en dehors de la ville. Ils travaillent donc à l'aménagement. Alors, ces jeunes, certains sont même issus de, de, de reconvertis de, du secteur touristique qui marche plus, des guides et autres porteurs qui travaillent là. Bon, donc ces jeunes-là sont apparemment responsables de, du transport du, du, du virus dans la ville. Et comme c'était à la veille de la fête de, du Ramadan, l'Aïd el fitr alors l'espace public de prière, je crois qu'il y a une espace contamination. Et en un jour, comme il y a le, le, bulletin, le bulletin sanitaire du ministère de la Santé et des Affaires Sociales, qui suit les, les actions de prévention et de riposte, en un seul jour, il a été recensé à Tombouctou 53 cas dont neuf de la MINUSMA. La MINUSMA, c'est la mission des Nations Unies de soutien au Mali. Sur 68 cas, 53 cas dans tous les Mali, 53 cas ont été recensés à Tombouctou. Et malheureusement, et ça, il faut, c'est encore le patrimoine, il y a deux maçons, chefs maçons qui sont morts, qui ont été victimes de la pandémie de COVID-19. Deux chefs maçons, c'est le, le chef maçon de Djingarebe, ce n'est pas certifié que ce soit Covid, mais apparemment c'est ça. Mais l'autre, le, le, celui de Sankoré, l'adjoint, le, le maçon adjoint de Sankoré, il s'appelle euh, Amaï Batoumani. Il est mort de, de ça. Mais la crise économique induite par le tourisme aussi, l'arrêt des activités touristiques depuis 2012 sur les sites, je parlais de ça. Cas de la mairie de Djenny qui percevait 30% de, de ses recettes du tourisme. Et la mairie n'arrive plus à payer ses travailleurs parce que le tourisme s'est arrêté brutalement. Les communautés vivant sur les sites sont davantage, beaucoup plus impactées par la crise. Il y a aussi la gestion des espaces, on en a parlé, hein. c'est différent dans en tout cas, les, les villes historiques, euh, Djenné ou Tombouctou, d'autres petites, d'autres villes comme Zanzibar, euh, l'île de Mozambique, etc. Vous avez des espaces partagés, comme les marchés. Les marchés, les gens se retrouvent, ou certaines places eh, conviviales, ils sont des lieux de rencontre, donc ils sont fermés à cause de ça. Alors, la gestion de ces espaces pose problème actuellement parce que le vivre ensemble a été, a été mis en cause. Les gens n'arrivent plus à se rencontrer correctement. Bon, dans tout ça, il faut parler de la, du soutien et de la solidarité internationale qui est en train de s'impliquer parce que l'aménagement, quoi qu'on dise à Tombouctou, a entrepris une grande action salvatrice. C'est l'occasion de saluer l'aménagement qui, depuis 2012, d'ailleurs, a fait beaucoup de choses à Tombouctou pour la reconstruction des mausolées, mais a entrepris une grande action de nettoyage, de désinfectation de, 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 de la ville, de lieux comme les marchés. Alors, le patrimoine, dans sa globalité, les populations, parce que quand on parle de patrimoine des villes, c'est des sites vivants, le tissu économique, on l'a dit, le tissu économique a été sérieusement ébranlé, il y a eu l'effondrement du tourisme. Et l'économie dans ces villes-là, comme l'a dit le gestionnaire de Yad, ça repose sur le tourisme et l'artisanat d'art. Actuellement, dans certains sites, sur certaines, dans certaines villes et sur certains sites, les artisans et autres acteurs 
peuvent sont carrément à l'arrêt. À Yaz, si on peut vendre en ligne ici, ce n'est pas possible. Alors, les pratiques culturelles, les cérémonies, on en a parlé hein, dans beaucoup de présentations, sont aussi remises en cause. C'est un coup d'arrêt brutal. Les festivités, les cérémonies rituelles euh, annuelles sont, sont complètement arrêtées. Les marchés, les marchés dans la plupart de, de, de ces grandes villes-là, on a dit qu'il faut arrêter les regroupements, distanciation sociale. Et dans certains cas, les gens, les gens sont réticents. Et ici, par exemple, ils vous disent eh, je préfère mourir de Covid que de mourir de, de faim. Et c'est pourquoi j'ai mis le, le marché de Madère tous les lundis. Ça n'a pas arrêté. Mais quand même, euh, c'est là pour euh, certains systèmes et méthodes endogènes de conservation sont momentanément arrêtés. Par exemple, à Gene, toujours, je prends ce cas. On a interdit le pétissage cette année. C'est la première fois, à ma connaissance, que cela est arrivé. On a interdit, c'est une pratique euh, communautaire annuelle qui regroupe euh, énormément de personnes et qui, qui a un impact euh, sur, sur la, au niveau de la, de la communauté. C'est-à-dire une occasion de se retrouver, euh, de vivre ensemble. Malheureusement, cette année, ça n'a pas pu avoir lieu. Alors, quelques questions que moi, je, je me suis posées en, en participant, en écoutant religieusement tous ces, tous ces débats. Alors, comment le patrimoine urbain des villes et les habitants se portent dans un tel contexte de crise. J'ai écouté beaucoup de cas où on ferme les marchés, où l'artisanat ne marche pas, où le, 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 les économies locales sont en souffrance. Comment les gens, qu'est-ce que les gens font Comment les acteurs culturels et touristiques s'organisent On a vu, par exemple, tous les hôtels sont fermés, hein? les, les agences de voyage pratiquement à l'arrêt. Mais quelle reconversion Qu'est-ce qu'ils font ça, c'est des questions qui méritent d'être posées. Est-ce qu'il y a des pratiques, des bonnes pratiques de résilience on peut, dont on peut parler, qui montrent que malgré l'impact de la, malgré la crise, les gens arrivent quand même à s'en sortir. Comment les communautés nationales, régionales et internationales réagissent-elles face aux crises qui affectent les patrimoines urbains et les habitants à travers le monde? Parce que quand c'est une pandémie mondiale, il y a eu des actions, les gouvernements, les décideurs politiques ont dit bon, on va mobiliser tel, tel, milliard, tel montant, 10 milliards, 15 milliards d'euros pour tel secteur, etc. Dans nos pays aussi, hein, ils ne sont pas restés en marche. Par exemple, la Côte d'Ivoire, ils ont dit 1 700 milliards pour faire face au, à la crise de peuple. Mais rarement, on parle de patrimoine des fonds destinés. L'autre jour, j'entendais euh, au Sénégal, les acteurs culturels, on leur donne un milliard. Mais c'est pour les éditions, les cinémas, etc. Je n'ai pas entendu le patrimoine. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire à ce niveau Quelle action appropriée de mitigation des différentes crises qui sévisent Parce que moi, je sors de la pandémie. Hein. Il y a d'autres crises souvent référentes. Quelle mesure, donc, euh, quelle action pourrait-on envisager dans l'esprit de la Convention de 72 et celui de la recommandation sur les paysages et comment empêcher ou prévenir la dégradation du patrimoine architectural et les espaces publics connexes quand ceux-ci sont soumis, ne sont pas plus soumis à des travaux réglés d'entretien et de maintenance qui assurent leur conservation durable. Parce que c'est ça aussi. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Est-ce qu'il faut rester pacifique attendre que tout se dégrade Les réalités n'étant pas les mêmes dans tous les pays, dans même dans les régions. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Qu'est-ce que solution, j'allais dire, euh, solution à, la, à peu près, à sorte de panacée Quel panacée Est-ce qu'il y a-t-il une, une panacée pour la question Je ne pense pas. Donc, comment relever le double, pré, double défi de la préservation de la valeur universelle exceptionnelle des villes du patrimoine mondial et la rapide et, massive, et le, la relance rapide et massive des activités économiques autour du tourisme et de l'art parce que déjà, on a ouvert les sites dans certains pays à la visite parce que euh, les gens sont étouffés économiquement quand bien même la pandémie continue. On a fermé les yeux. Bon, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pour relancer Est-ce qu'on peut éviter un tourisme de masse Moi, je 
crois que oui. Certains ont dit non, ça va être ça. Mais moi, je crois que oui, parce que les gens restent prudents quand même. Alors, l'impact de crise sur le patrimoine des villes n'est plus à démontrer dans, ce, dans ces conditions, tout le monde le sait. Les communautés urbaines vivant dans ces sites sont les premières victimes. Les décideurs politiques à différents niveaux doivent prendre en compte la gestion du patrimoine de ces villes dans les plans stratégiques pour figurer ces crises. Les meilleurs cadres pour aider au relèvement du patrimoine et accompagner la résilience des communautés, moi je pense que c'est celui des objectifs, les ODD 2030. Mike parlait du développement durable tout à l'heure, il a fait beaucoup de suggestions. Et comment concilier valeurs universelles, valeurs locales et comment s'appuyer sur les, les, les réalités de chaque site hein, pour mener des actions qui puissent conduire à la gestion durable, harmonieuse. Hein? Et qu'est-ce qu'on qu peut entreprendre dans ce domaine Ça, c'est des questions qui, qui sont venues de façon courante. Alors, le patrimoine dispose à la fois d'une valeur identitaire, valeur culturelle, pour les détentrices et d'une valeur marchande. C'est comme le disait l'ancien ministre de la culture de Trinité, de Chaouche, il disait que le patrimoine, c'est d'abord une valeur, avant d'être une marchandise. Est-ce que c'est même une marchandise La question se pose. Donc, comment faire en sorte que euh, leur, les économies locales <coughs> puissent être promues et que cela puisse contribuer à la conservation durable des ressources culturelles et naturelles des sites On a parlé d'équilibre entre euh, euh, la conservation et le développement. Comment concilier après cette crise Il y a pas sûr déjà, c'est une équation difficile à résoudre, on ne peut pas le résoudre tout de suite, mais il faut penser à trouver un équilibre entre, entre, entre les deux. Donc, en termes de perspective, en termes de perspective, les patrimoines des villes sont soumis à diverses pressions. On en a beaucoup parlé, hein. Il y a la pression démographique. Je vous prends un cas. Gené, quand on inscrivait le site en 1988, la population était de 5 000 habitants. Et en 2009, c'est les chiffres recensés officiellement, c'était 32 000. Vous voyez les, les cas. Donc, il y a une forte pression. Et l'espace, comme l'espace, euh, comment on appelle ça, n'est pas extensible. Gené est une ville, un presqu'île. Alors, ça amène beaucoup de, de, de problèmes de promiscuité, d'occupation illégale, de questions de spéculation foncière et de pression locale. Alors, je pense que euh, dans ce cadre, le patrimoine, tout le monde pense comme ça, on doit être intégré dans les projets et programmes de développement en tant que volet spécifique, surtout dans les politiques des villes. C'est là que le problème se pose énormément. Et je voudrais quand même... <coughs> Avant de terminer, ouvrir davantage les débats, parler de la question de gouvernance. Hein? Le, le changement de l'environnement urbain doit se faire dans le respect strict du patrimoine des villes. Et pour cela, il faut réaliser des études d'impact dans le cadre des programmes de développement urbain, politique des villes et des, de l'habitat. Mais dans, le pays, dans nos pays, je parle de, en tant qu'Africain au sud du Sahara, les projets et programmes de développement urbain intègrent très rarement la dimension cité, cité historique, patrimoine, donc la dimension patrimoine, patrimoine urbain dans la, réalise, la mise en œuvre de ces projets et programmes de développement urbain. Et les villes s'étendent tous les jours. Et ça, c'est un aspect sur lequel on doit, on doit beaucoup, on doit beaucoup prendre en compte dans le futur programme de gestion des villes du patrimoine mondial. Et un dernier point, un dernier point, euh, avant de terminer, parce que. Oui, j'en ai fini. Pour conclure, 
j'en ai fini. Il y a un dernier point qui s'est invité dans nos débats, on n'en a pas parlé. J'aimerais bien qu'on en parle, c'est euh, cette histoire de, des sites liés aux des sites négriers et des sites euh, liés à la colonisation. Parce que dans les villes, les villes historiques, c est, c est, ça existe. Et avec cette affaire de George Floyd assassiné en, aux États-Unis, il y a beaucoup de réactions. Réactions épidermiques et souvent réactions très logiques. Je sais que le centre du patrimoine de l'UNESCO, le, le comité du patrimoine mondial, a, géré, a eu à gérer des cas comme ça. Qu'est-ce que l'on peut faire dans ce cadre Il y a par exemple le site de euh, Kunta Kinte en Gambie qui a changé de nom, c'était Fort James, on a mis Fort Kunta Kinte. Qu'est-ce que l'on peut entreprendre Tout cela au, à la lumière de la Convention, mais aussi de la charte de Venise, de la déclaration de Nara, etc. Je vous remercie, j'en ai fini. Thank you very much. It was very rich and you had a lot of very valuable points. Um, you know, the, the, uh, I'm not trying to, sh to keep anybody's comments short, but just to be able to manage uh, everything that we have planned and allow for a little discussion. So uh, we had, in fact, planned for two separate discussions, one after Michael and one after Lasana, but now we're just going to do one because we're running short of time. So now the floor is open. We have a lot of different things that have been brought up. You've brought up many things in your presentations of the, the group work. We have the, the points raised by the provocateurs. So we have uh, the points that have been beautifully uh, synthesized around sustainability and resilience by Michael and Lasana. And now the floor is open. We will not have very many, uh, we, you know, because we have only about 40 minutes left, so 35. So we're going to be quite short. Please keep your interventions really short so that we can come back uh, for another round. Thank you very much. I see that Eduardo has been quick. Have your hand up. You go first, Eduardo. Hi. Well, first of all, congratulations to all participants. This has been absolutely great, and the ideas have been really you know, brilliant, and I've uh, not only enjoyed this immensely, but also learned a lot. So thank you so very much. But just wanted to just bring that uh, the, 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 here we have tons of channels, of challenges and difficulties. But I think to me, one of the core things that is, uh, is distilling from this debate is that uh, we certainly are in the urgent need to change course in uh, our conception of the conservation. And uh, in the same way, we many years ago, we moved from the movement to the neighborhood and then from the neighborhood to the, of the mo 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 monuments into the cities. And so now we need to move from the cultural approach, exceedingly narrow cultural approach, sorry to tell this thing, a, from the urban perspective into a more integrated approach into how heritage plays in the role of the whole city. And that poses enormous management and, and, and governance issues, but brings a lot of opportunity. And that's the critical thing. Because one of the, if, 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 just take two aspects. Uh, we have discussed that probably whose community are we talking about? Very inspiring question earlier. And then, you know, well, is the elite that decides that it's culturally important? Or is the whole city which finds this area or this heritage to be important for them? As in, by moving into bringing heritage preservation into the management of the city, we have the option to uh, you know, bring uh, the, the debate into the much wider audience and then much broader support from political and financial and so on. Another example, very simple, from the now from the perspective of the conservators, we are now very, very comfortable with adaptive rehabilitation as a way of preserving things and the contribution of, you know, the, 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 the typological analysis that Italian cities brought into the debate, you know, is very significant. Well, that's a significant entryway into discussing heritage preservation in part of urban development and managing of change. And that, so from both sides, there are going to be, you know, enormous co contributions to a much uh, sustainable and particularly bottom-up uh, approach to uh, dealing with our cities. And I think that this lab has brought these issues to the forefront and we are now here, here, you know, about 80 or, or more uh, participants that were much more aware of that. And I'm, I'm very happy that uh, gradually um, 
preservation of the urban heritage is becoming what I, almost 20 years ago I said is the concern of the whole society and all social actors. Thank you so much, Jody, for this. Thank you very much, Eduardo. We have a long list and uh, my colleagues are helping me keep track. Uh, so we have Christina next. Christina Lodi, please go ahead. If I could request everybody to raise their hand on participant list, that's easier for us to manage. Yes, I'd like to thank you to be invited to participate of this lab because I learned a lot and I think I could contribute as well with this, uh, this experience of being working with this site of conscience in Brazil. And I moved forward from uh, working with the uh, urban uh, cultural landscape of Rio de Janeiro, a very large area of Rio, to the site of conscience of the Valongo War. And I think I, I would add to Mike that we have to, to learn and to study the culture that we are dealing with. And in this particular uh, site of conscience, we are dealing with uh, this wonderful uh, African culture. And I'd like to end my contribution with this uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu uh, term that means I am because we are. And in more large uh, philosophical sense, it means that belief in universal bond of sharing that connects all humanity. I think it's a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, gave by this COVID crisis to make us think that we need more and more to bring the community together when we are talking about this, uh, the sites and the living uh, of these communities in our site. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we're moving to Russell, Russell Gold from IUCM. Thank you, Giotti, and thank you to UNESCO, actually, um, for what has been a really fascinating, engaging and inspiring journey of learning for me personally. And I think I can speak on behalf of my colleague, Tim, who's also been taking part in, in this series of, of webinars. Um, I, I, I was also pleased to hear nature being mentioned. Often we, we lose nature when we talk about cultural heritage, but it's very much part of culture. And I would like to just emphasize the, the, the importance and potential of urban nature to relieve cities from many of the most pressing urban challenges that they face. So heat stress, flooding, air pollution, to name but a few, also, also mental health, public health, of course, um, especially during these um, rather anxious times with, with COVID-19 causing such havoc. Um, and in that vein, I would just like to flag that IUCN has been developing an urban nature index, which is poised for development uh, and for launch at the uh, World Conservation Congress that we will organize in Marseille in January. And this urban nature index will just uh, lay out a set of indicators for conducting natural capital baseline assessments and ensuring that uh, targets can be set and, and meaningfully assessed for cities that want to do better uh, in managing their urban nature. And, and we stand ready to support UNESCO and, and its partners and our partners, and we would be very interested to work with the cities here uh, moving forward to provide technical assistance in, in making the most of urban nature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Russell. Uh, we are delighted that you, at your interventions, and we'd be delighted to continue working and integrate more, and hopefully we can have more future urban labs, uh, World Heritage uh, City Labs, where we can also reflect more on, uh, on nature-based solutions uh, for, historic, uh, for historic urban centers, for the World Heritage Cities. Moving Thank now to... Um, I think I lost my list somewhere, but uh, I think we have Daniel Pini. Daniel, please yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, uh, so there were so many issues that were raised during this session that I don't know where to start with, but I would like to pick a few points that to me uh, needs to be taken into consideration to elaborate um, guidelines and uh, 
and to and way way forward. The first one is, uh, I mean, when Marino L said that heritage is not a community but has to be considered as a public good. Uh, I think that uh, this is a, a very important, a fundamental aspect to be taken into consideration because too often heritage is considered as an asset for developing local communities to develop uh, economy, local economy, as, a, as an attraction for tourism. I think that we have to skip this uh, view and that we have to consider heritage in a broader sense as a kind, as a as a public good. Uh, second, uh, I agree with, very much with Minja when she says that uh, maybe <clears throat> World Heritage Sites should be inscribed for a limited number of years in order to control if they keep the values that justify their inscription and particularly the values of uh, uh, integrity. And I'm, I was very glad to hear that she was talking also of functional integrity. Functions and activities may completely change the meaning of a site. And uh, I think it's extremely important to consider functional integrity as one of uh, the parameters that uh, to be taken into consideration to inscribe a site in the World Heritage List. Uh, finally, uh, finally, yes. <laughs> I also agree very much with Mike. Uh, I totally share his beautiful and inspiring intervention when he says that uh, to manage urban heritage architecture is not sufficient. This is another very important point. However, I would like to say that architecture is important. Even if it is not sufficient, architecture remains important. I say that not only because I'm an architect, but because I'm strongly convinced that architecture is, uh, in the end, uh, the tool to preserve the meaning or to enhance the meaning uh, of uh, the heritage. When I'm talking of architecture, I'm also talking of uh, conservation architecture, of a new design architecture, and so on. It's a very long story, but I think that this point is very important, and I think that there is a lot of work to be done in the, in the teaching of architecture, in the research in architecture, which has been a little bit overlooked in the last few years, not to say decades. Finally, Tulesana would say that COVID-19 is important. We don't know what will be the impact in the future. But I would like to say that what is important is the impact on the society, not only on the world heritage cities, and, uh, and I think that uh, the real impact uh, is the consequences of the crisis that we have already passed or that, that is ending now. And uh, nobody knows exactly how this crisis will impact and will affect the future development. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting and inspiring session. Thank you so much, Daniele. Um, right, we have now uh, Shadia, Shadia Khan. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, just a minute. I think my video. Shadia, your voice is yes. very Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Thank I'm you. just trying to get the video working, uh, but it, it's okay. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I mean, the session today just sums up brilliantly all the discussions and um, deliberations we had for almost two weeks now. And I'm happy to see that there is almost um, a united outlook on um, um, most of the issues within what we have seen from the presentations, from the discussions, and um, uh, from the working groups after that, that um, the um, importance of involving the community, taking into consideration the role of the community, Yeah, we lost you. And this, this is, yeah. um, this is the, uh, 
um, their life, this is their, their cities, and um, they have worked, uh, them and their ancestors, for generations to uh, keep it working. And I would like to um, um, just uh, say that, um, as we have discussed, I mean, uh, the adaptive reuse, it's not a modern notion. I mean, all the all these years you can see in, in historic cities, layers of, of uh, different civilizations in the same building or the same complex. And because everybody used the same traditional material and traditional uh, building uh, procedures, it just, blends together and, and looks the same, and they use it for functions, whether it's economic, adding cult cultural, or adding commercial centers, and so on. So um, what we are uh, um, definitely um, agreeing on, or many of us are, is that the urban, the urban historic centers have their, their uh, special uh, community needs, and that the economy need to be reinvented to provide a balance between protecting heritage while addressing the community uh, priorities, encourage local initiatives for job creation. Um, to, there are many lessons to learn from the communities as we have seen, and uh, many lessons we learn from the sessions. Thank you very much, Jyoti, I can't thank you enough. Uh, but um, what we need to, 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 to think about is um, where, where, where do the decision makers stand in all this? Uh, who can hear us? You know, we are, we are uh, I'm sorry for want of a better word, we're a bunch of, of, of experts and activists and uh, people who understand uh, the, both situations. I mean, we need to, to we try to balance the need to uh, preserve the, the, the heritage while addressing the needs of the community. But while we're discussing this, and, and I mean, there are books that can be published based on all the discussions and all the presentation we had, and thank you very much, all of you, and I would like to thank uh, Rami Daher uh, and, and other uh, working group presentation, and also specifically Michael uh, Turner, an old friend, and how he wrapped up most of these things, and, and uh, your beautiful sketches as well. So the fundamental... Or how can we reach us as a group? But I mean, basically, we're looking at UNESCO to do that and other organizations, um, whether academic institutions or international organizations um, that deal with housing needs and deal with, with refugees and, and, and as well as dealing with protecting natural and uh, um, natural and cultural heritage and intangible heritage. Uh, many lessons to learn, and I've seen in the presentations, you know, very positive initiatives in, in many historic centers we have seen from Rami Dahir's presentation. All the good news that we see in Cairo, all the good news that we see in, in Tunis and, and others. Unfortunately, the reality is not the same. This is only a partial reality. These are uh, initiatives or pilots or uh, um, partial success stories, but I mean, if you know Cairo, and I'm sure many of you do, it's it's it, 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 there are two communities there. There is all the improvements uh, serve the tourists and serve the the politicians and and the local councillors and, and and so on. Uh, Tunis is another story. You know, when the politics change, uh, the old city of of Tunis also has changed and started to suffer. A city that had three Al Khan awards for three different housing neighborhoods, um, you know, just one, one after the other. Uh, now they are they are talking about you know dilapidated buildings and 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 people who have you don't have even the basic uh, services uh, to survive within um, the residential area. Now we look back at what we hear on CNN and BBC and 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 other. Um, TVs and radios and internet uh, 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 kind of facilities. The politicians are not thinking like that at all. All we all we hear is uh, the discussion is about uh, how to encourage investment, 
how to revive the tourism, how to do this, how to do that, how to raise the dollar, how to raise the sterling pound, what do we do here, what do we do that. They have major serious problems. I mean, they're responsible people. They're responsible for billions of, of dollars or pounds or euros, and, and, and they have to, to address the, 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 um, the impossible economic uh, decline that came all of a sudden, and they don't know where to go from there, and the, Euro the European Union cannot even agree on, on one way to look at it. So um, they want to bring back the tourists. They want to encourage investment. They want to, to bring people to build more, uh, probably high-rise um, buildings, hotels, and, and, and so on. So and we can see how we are showered in our... Uh, through Shadia, could we maybe... Add, okay. I'll try to finish quickly. So how can... What I want to say is that how can UNESCO and the relevant international academic uh, institutions... Uh, know about this side of the story. I mean, how can we involve them? And how can we regulate what the, the, the signatories to especially the, the inscribed sites who have signed, whether they're a ministry or whether it's a, um, a, a municipality, whatever, how can you make them accountable for what happens in the old city, taking into consideration all what was discussed and the management plans and the monitoring and all that. It's, it is the responsibility, it's a huge responsibility, I know, Jyoti, and we cannot here just um, kind of theorize about what should be done. We understand that it's important, but I mean, how can we bridge this gap, how we link with them? You are the only, um, you are the only link, you know, and, and you have a tough job. Thank you very much. Thank you all. This has been Thank you. Thank most, you. most interesting and um educating uh, two weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shadia. Thank you very much. Uh, we move now to Adnan. Uh, and then we had, I uh, guess there's a couple of other people who didn't put their hand up. And I know there's Rosabella, I think, who, uh, whose hand is up. So Adnan and then Rosabella. Adnan. Merci à, à, à toutes et, et à tous. Uh, Et merci à vous, Madame Yoti, pour avoir géré euh, ces séances. C'était très difficile, je pense. Euh, euh, je, je pense, j'ai juste une petite, euh, peut-être, recommandation. C'est un avis, mais c'est ça vient de ma propre expérience. Euh, le problème dans la gestion de notre patrimoine historique, urbain, euh, nos ensembles historiques, qu'on appelle communément en Tunisie, Aussi, quelque part, c'est un problème institutionnel. C'est que euh, la gestion de ces ensembles historiques, euh, elle est encore centralisée dans une seule institution qui gère le, tout le patrimoine en Tunisie. Et ça, c'est un grave problème. On ne peut plus continuer comme ça. Donc, sur le plan structurel, il faut revoir un autre organigramme, même au niveau de la conception des ministères et des institutions euh, gouvernementales qui vont euh, gérer ce bien. Et d'ailleurs, ça se complique encore un peu plus maintenant parce que on est dans une décentralisation où on cherche à donner le pouvoir aux communes à travers un nouveau code des collectivités locales. Et on a eu vraiment peur en ce qui concerne la gestion de nos ensembles historiques. Et vous savez ce qu'on a fait L'article 117, on a inclus un article, l'article 117 dans les codes de collectivité locale, où toute intervention, où toute étude, où tout, où tout projet qui touche aux ensembles historiques doit être fait dans l'administration centrale. Et là, on va noyer encore plus une administration centrale qui actuellement n'est pas capable de gérer tous les ensembles historiques sur le territoire tunisien. Moi, ce que je propose, et j'espère qu'elle soit une recommandation qui a été dite, euh, proposée dans euh, d'autres dans euh, séances et occasions euh, avec l'UNESCO, c'est la création d'une autre institution qui va s'occuper uniquement des ensembles historiques dont la gestion est complètement différente 
des sites archéologiques, par exemple. Si on regarde l'Institut, par exemple, national du patrimoine auquel j'appartiens, encore, il est pour la majorité euh, orienté vers l'archéologie antique et vers les sites archéologiques. Et les ensembles historiques n'ont pas vraiment, c'est un petit département, et imaginez un peu euh, la gestion, comment ça se passe. Donc, il serait préférable, à mon avis, de faire une recommandation que vu la gestion d'un ensemble historique dans un contexte urbain très particulier comme élément de la ville, il lui faut un département spécifique euh, euh, qui, euh, qui peut vraiment euh, gérer euh, ces, ces situations très complexes et très particulières. Voilà, j'espère que je n'ai pas été très long. Thank you. Merci, merci beaucoup. Uh, we move quickly for very short uh, interventions from uh, Rosabella. Please go ahead. Uh, hello. Yes. Um, yes. Please go ahead. So, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I want to thank Maya for the, my the the narrator because I, I, I we all had to work very hard, and I want to thank her for putting all together, even though it was cobbled through a lot of stories that everyone sent. Um, one thing that I'm curious about is technology, because there's a lot of a lot of comments about uh, bringing um, using technology and the internet for communication for marketplace. But I'm also worried about the larger infrastructure that needs to work in place for especially for the internet as um as a marketplace to work because you need the postage systems working, you need delivery systems, you need a, a steady supply of electricity. Um, so it's like, it's this online world depends a lot on the continuity of a real life world. And, um, and I think how, uh, uh, and I think it's something to highlight that as how that becomes important and also and also something uh, that i read a book on the on the social media in a town in brazil and then after i read it i also uh, saw it uh, on my own in, in, among people the important role that smartphones um have taken even uh, among um Uh, people who are who are communities who are who don't have a lot of privileges, um, they rely a lot on smartphones uh, to have access to the world, to have access, especially in this pandemic. Um, for example, uh, women who live in cities, uh, they use smart world to send money to their family. Uh, they use smart uh, smartphones to communicate, and how important it has become even for people who are. Uh, in many ways illiterate because you know through a phone you can send an audio message it doesn't matter anymore if you can it doesn't matter in many senses so I'm really interested in learning what technologies uh, what are what are the structures what are the infrastructures that have to keep technology going especially when you want to replace um, uh, real life interactions with technology and especially the digital world. And I'm especially interested in learning what technologies, either hard technologies and so, and especially I, I like to hear about soft technology and soft infrastructure. Um, what what Thank are you. the, because um, what are the, what have you found? What are your experiences with them, especially in this scenario? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, three last speakers. I think uh, we close the list with that. Uh, we have uh, uh, was Medani from Eritrea, and uh, I, I lost the Gurmi, and um, Marie Noel. And I think Rami Daher also wanted a minute. So please, please keep it really short. But uh, uh, Medani, please go ahead. Okay, so first, okay, are you hearing me? Okay, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity you give me. Uh, I would like also to appreciate for the World Heritage Center for organizing, organizing this uh, successful World Heritage Lab. So maybe my uh, 
my uh, my point goes to uh, concerning to the public space. Now we are in the COVID crisis. The role of public space is uh, very important. So now uh, cities, uh, be it in the developing and in e everywhere, has to introduce uh, uh, a green and public space for the the cities is a very, very important because we have to revisit our planning, especially when we are dealing in the historic city or towns. Uh, land is very, very uh, uh, in the competition. So uh, all available land is as much as possible to use it for uh, a green uh, and people's uh, meeting space and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just uh, part of this, uh, the way forward the role of public space is very, very important as uh, previous speakers like Professor Pini and others uh, like Professor Michael already forward. So another issue also how do we uh, balance urban heritage vis-a-vis -vis sustainable level is a very, very complex issue. So maybe we have to uh, make further research on this perspective. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gurmeet, you're on. And you have a met. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Jyoti. This has been really wonderful. Um, I'm mean, learning new technology, how to use this Microsoft um, uh, Teams platform and so on. And it's been wonderful interacting with such wonderful minds on this digital platform. Um, I uh, no, I mean, like what Shadia said, you know, we also, in our practice, are working in a space which is uh, very often... Um, you know, there's this hopelessness and this helplessness that we feel. And then we look at the platform of UNESCO to help us out and give us that little ray of hope to kind of carry on with our work. You know, I mean, that's something about the heritage practitioners, that they're committed, it comes from within. Now, one request that I would like to uh, make to UNESCO is whether, you know, in India, we are really not coming, uh, we are not really being able to, document or even and share uh, the way um, how cities, historic cities have responded to COVID and uh, what kind of, how they manage the physical space, how did they uh, service uh, with, base, uh, with essential services and such like. And also within this is a lot of knowledge which is uh, traditional and which actually is very innovative. It works in the space of social innovation or technological innovation or even institutional innovation, which is, can be a huge learning for us um, in a, you know, to find a post-colonial language of engaging with our historic cities. So I would just use this platform to place a, to place a request whether UNESCO could create a platform for this kind of documentation and sharing of knowledge between all of us uh, to keep the the rainbow shining, you know. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marie Noel. You have thirty seconds. Marie Noel, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Go ahead. Quickly, to come back to this idea of large scale and how heritage values can impact specific sectors beyond heritage and looking at uh, building new economic models, because that's also something which has been uh, stressed a lot. Um, this is, is going to be very difficult because we're, we're actually fighting, we would be fighting like the, the big groups. But again, building, how can traditional know-how and uh, building materials be used. We're not just talking of restoration, but new areas, new district, even high rise to some extent. There have been experiments. So again, this is going beyond conservation. It's being proactive and heritage for development. Same thing for energy. Uh, okay, wind farms, large scale wind farms, which are same business as oil, uh, economic model, big companies, energy, smaller scale, manage, at local areas, connecting grids. Same for transport. And again, high tech. High tech, I'm being a bit political at this point. High tech, if it's still Google, Amazon, this is gonna kill Thank us. But, uh, so again, change of scale and 
change of ambition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maynel. Okay, um, we have uh, Rami Daher as last intervention. Please go ahead. Just unmute. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll be very quick. What I'm going to say relates a little bit indirectly to what May Noel had just said. Um, I want to create a link. I mean, we, we talked about the, the historic urban landscape, how, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a vision uh, that emerging uh, within, within, our, within our discipline, which is extremely important. And I want to create a very quick link with, with another vision that has been created in the past 15 years in the in the field of, of urban design and landscape, which is the uh, uh, the concepts of landscape urbanism, because I feel that there are a lot of links uh, that benefit from breaking boundaries between different disciplines. They have a lot of things in common, uh, mainly in, in, in issues related to urban ecology and how we deal with urban ecology, and also with the, with the methodologies and the importance of layering. So I think it's, it's very helpful uh, uh, when we talk about city to, to look at different uh, uh, emerging visions and how to link these ideas together through breaking of boundaries between disciplines. And this very much links into what just uh, uh, Mary Noel had just said, even though indirectly. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was just reminded by my colleagues that uh, we are missing Macmillan Mendo, who had asked for the floor. Macmillan, please go ahead. Macmillan? Macmillan, Modendo, please go ahead. Order. Um, Macmillan? My apologies if I, uh, if we, we lost you, but um, before we uh, now wrap up, and I'm going to ask Mike and Lasana to speak for 20 seconds each. Uh, we do need uh, to take one more photo, if we could. So please, could I request absolutely everyone engaged in this to turn on their cameras so we can have one nice group photo, please. And may I request you, Rahil, to please take all the pages if you can. Christina, I'm looking at Rahil, Minja, we need everybody's faces. Thank you very much. Ah, there we have, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent, thank you. I want now to just turn very quickly to Mike and Lasana for 20 seconds each. Mike, go ahead, please. Um, thank you. I, I think that um, I don't think I've got a lot more to say because I think that it has been uh, very enriched. I think that there is two challenges I'd like to take away from this. One is that um, the architectural role and the role of the community within the urban heritage, it's, uh, it's working together and actually doing something. Um, the second one is to really to change then the um, the emphasis by which we can then uh, address the uh, the decision makers within um, uh, urban heritage. And I think that this is a role which we all have as civil society. I think joining together will be the main uh, challenge and the main issue that we will deal with. And this, in fact, comes from the digital technology, which I spoke about, that this is what's empowering people in the street. Thank you. And again, thank you for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lasana? Oui, merci beaucoup, Dieti. En fait, je, je récapitule très rapidement sur deux points. Euh, repenser, il faut repenser l'économie post-2019, euh, euh, excusez-moi, COVID-19, en gérant le flux touristique et en préservant les patrimoine pour ne pas tuer l'âme des villes. Je répète, je crois, Eduardo qui a parlé de ça. En français, on dit, il ne faut pas tuer la poule aux œufs d'or. Donc, c'est l'occasion, à quelque chose de malheur et bon, comme on l'a dit, il faut penser à ça, dans le cadre de cette réflexion. Alors, 
La conservation et le développement centré sur l'économie locale, c'est un point qui a attiré aussi mon attention. Et apparemment, je crois qu'avec la crise, les deux deviennent de plus en plus pas réconciliables, mais difficiles à réconcilier, à concilier, pas réconcilier, à concilier. Donc, ce point doit attendre, doit être retenu dans nos, dans nos futures réflexions pour trouver un équilibre entre ce que les populations locales gagnent et les autres acteurs du développement économique, les tour opérateurs, etc. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Lassana. Thank you to all of the excellent speakers, all of the participants, all the wealth of ideas that have been shared over the last uh, couple of weeks, all the hard work that has gone in from your part as well as ours uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, I wanted just to wrap up with a few short things. I'm not going to try to respond to so many of the very rich points that came up. I just want to be able to talk about very quickly, first of all, the world heritage processes, because it's really important to keep in mind what UNESCO is about and what we can do and can take forward, and also what processes you can be engaged in for your end. Because any new construction or addition or demolition within a World Heritage property requires that the World Heritage Center be, con be contacted, the advisory bodies be consulted. So it's really important that you remain the advocate in a sense of World Heritage. You engage with the cities, the sites, and you work with us closely. And that's where we become, it's a partnership. It's not, and this is really why we value very much having with us the site managers. The site managers, I mean, I, I want to say, I, I, I understand what you're saying, Nadia, but we're not here just discussing ideas. We have site managers who are really on the ground dealing with all of these different levels. And part of what we want to do is to form a really strong community where we work with the site managers. We are behind you and find all the site managers to make it happen, not just at the very local level. We work at the local level, but then, of course, UNESCO is also working at the level of international policy and work with national commitments and so on. That's for us. But what you want to remember is to work with the World Heritage Processes where anything that does not seem to go according to the, to the, uh, the convention will be discussed at the World Heritage Committee meetings. And Michael can tell you all about uh, how these discussions happen, but it's really important to remember that protecting OUV of the World Heritage sites is really, really critical from that perspective. So um, the second part of, of this uh, aspect of World Heritage, uh, very quickly, I see that the minutes are running, is just uh, the management plan being signed and sealed. Somebody mentioned that in the idea of, of, of guidelines, for example. Now, the management plan is ever evolving, has to be updated, has to be integrated with the urban development plan. So this is where you matter and this is where you can make a change. And this is where we are absolutely ready and willing at any time to work with you. The idea of what we bring as an outcome from this, um, this lab is not really one single monumental set of, 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 of guidelines or something like that, but really a plural set of ideas, a plural set of solutions. We're urbanists. We're talking about a townscape. We're not talking about a single monument. So in this townscape, every one of the different areas have their own solution, their own specificities. But the idea is that together we build a resilience, we build it together, and we work on this together. And that is the togetherness that we want to be able to take forward that I think is necessary. Also, we have entry points, the 2030 agenda and the new urban agenda, the climate change, our commitments that every one of the cities have made, every one of the countries have made, so we need to be able, we need to be able to use those entry points to work with culture and cultural heritage to be able to make it happen 
with the historic urban landscape recommendation that all the countries have also adopted. So we need to be able to take it forward with those entry points. Um, finally, just to say, what is the future of the lab? Uh, of course, in terms of the immediate outcomes, we're looking at putting out a report at the end of two weeks or so that uh, you know, we wait for all your inputs and uh, we, we put together a report and we really welcome all the written documents, suggestions, features, PTs that all of you have shared with us. Um, and we hope that this is only the very first uh, World Heritage City Lab. Uh, we are more than delighted and would be, and welcome suggestions and, and partnerships to take forward other heritage labs. There's so many more topics. Governance has come up over and over again, and we cannot overemphasize how important this is. But we can also set up good practices. So if you will enable us, send us your good practices, then we can put it up and put up a site. How do we stay in touch? We stay in touch. Um, we don't have our own Facebook. We have the UNESCO Facebook. Uh, so I think the best way is that we have the Urban Notebook. If you have not received it, this is a new um, newsletter that we just started a couple of months ago. We will send it to you. If you have not been receiving it, stay on our mailing list. This picks our platform to have a dialogue, to continue to know what you're doing, to stay updated, so we remain a community. We also have, we'll set up the Good Practices platform so that we can post what you send us. And uh, we plan other city lab. And we can also do um, use hashtags on social media to be able to post. So the World Heritage Cities, is a very uh, normal kind of, uh, you know, just hashtag World Heritage Cities, use that as a hashtag, or use hashtag HUL Urban Heritage as another hashtag that can become. So we know that we are able to stay, and we can send you this in an email, so this is another way to stay in touch. So we can develop new documentation methodologies, other types of things, but uh, we can also have regional workshops where we work with specific regions where we have cities from a particular region, we look at problem solving. So they're really practical labs. They are working together collaboratively. It's not about any one person having all the answers. It's very clear from this lab, we need to work together. And we remain together as a community of inherited specialists, as a community of friends. I hope that the next time we meet you, we're able to enjoy a nice drink and a nice uh, dinner, lunch uh, together and spend a few days uh, reflecting. But meanwhile, stay well and thank you all again.